What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Happy New Year, fellow poker players, fellow and poker enthusiasts. Welcome back to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. We took a small break, but we're back. Many interesting guests lined up for 2024. So make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button. That really helps grow the channel so we can get bigger guests on in the future. I'm sure 2024, you guys have all have very big and ambitious goals. And in order to help you reach that goals, we have decided to reopen the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program. If you want to work with me, And Adam, now is the chance. Make sure you don't miss out for this first 2024 edition. We have opened enrollment for anyone and put together our best promotion ever. Because for the next few weeks, you can enroll in the Mechanics 2.0 with a 25% discount and get three bonuses worth close to 3,000 euros in free extra value. Okay. So go over to mechanicsofpoker.com. Take advantage of this limited opportunity to kickstart 2024 and achieve your poker goals. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com for more info and start work with me and Adam and achieve all your 2024 poker goals. Today, looking back at the pods we did last year, I particularly liked our Russian colleagues. So for this very episode, we will chat with another Russian high-stakes cash game player, Nikolai Dirdom1. Evdokimov, did I say that correctly? I could have been butchering that. Evdokimov, I'm going to keep it at that. Nikolai broke through to the high stakes scene a couple of years ago after playing mid stakes for about six years. He has experienced coaching and playing at all levels and attributes his success to hard work, having a deep love, interest, and curiosity for the game. He has agreed to come on the pod to share his perspective on poker with the audience with the hopes that some of these will be valuable on your poker journey. Adam, happy new year to you too. Any new year's resolutions you set for 2024? And while you're at it, do you have maybe any tips for players that have set new year's resolutions, how to actually reach them? Well, yeah, happy new year to you and to our audience. We are back with more podcasts and hopefully we're in a good rhythm for the year ahead. So yeah, myself, I've spent a lot of time the last week or so reflecting on the year that's just gone by. So I'll just go through the process I like to uh, to go through is basically, first of all, distilling success, what went well in the previous year. So just looking back, things I'm happy with, things I'm proud of, things I showed up with consistently and goals I progressed towards. Then I go into my failures, things I didn't show up so well, things I didn't quite progress with, goals I didn't achieve that I wanted to at the start of the year, and what can I learn from those things. So I try to do a little bit of reflecting on the kind of good and the bad side of it. And then finally, I go into uh, what can I improve for the year ahead? So uh, I think for everyone listening, the new year is a good chance to go, what do I want to achieve for the year ahead? So for me, I focus on more identity-based stuff. Who do I want to be this year? What version of myself do I want to step into for the year ahead? What challenges do I want to take on and where do I want to go? So uh, one specific challenge for me this year is I'm going to do a powerlifting event in a few months. That was something I've wanted to do last year and didn't do. So on my reflection, I went, right, I'm going to put that to bed and I'm going to make sure I take action. But for me, my goals are generally around growing as a person and taking on challenges that are aligned with that. And yeah, hopefully our audience are ready to grow. And this podcast today will be your first growth opportunity to learn some new stuff that you can apply straight away. Well, before we dive into our podcast today, I would like to give a big shout out to our sponsor, GTO Wizard. We are proud to announce a technological breakthrough. 
Introducing GTO Wizard AI. This powerful technology can solve any custom poker spot in seconds to high accuracy. Unlike pre-solved solutions, this allows you to edit the solving parameters. That means you can modify the ranges, change the stack and pot sizes, customize the betting tree, and automatically simplify and optimize your bet sizes. Brace yourself, the meta is about to change. So sign up to GTO Wizard using the link below, gtowizard.com slash mechanics. Get 10% off your first month and join the weekly coaching webinars of which one every month is with me. Looking forward to educating you guys there. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Nikolai. All right, Nikolai, yeah. thank you for coming on the podcast, man. Thank you for having me. Well, Nikolai, you have been playing poker professionally for, I believe it is nine years now. And of those nine years, I think for like the last three years, you've been competing at the highest online games. And the first question that comes to mind is what motivates you to compete in these high stakes cash games? Mm -hmm. I would say it's not about uh, what motivates me, but what demotivates me. Because uh, when I reach... Uh, first reached like 1k 2k nl um i was always told that uh high stakes game uh, are dead like there is no high stakes game anymore no reason to go for 5 10k on stars because there's no uh enough uh, good game so i was i always uh, thought that i shouldn't really go there i should just basically earn some money and uh, try to uh do something with that money so i go play offline poker i uh, staked lots of people in uh, mtts in cash games i did some like business uh, tries uh, offline uh i did lots of investing in crypto <laughs> as like everybody in poker world i think so it was uh not about motivation but about this motivation i would say and uh, things changed when uh, GG came because uh, GG came with uh, lots of um, lots of high stakes games. And actually, um, I first uh, played on GG like five or even six years ago. It's been it's been a lot uh, already. So uh, when I first uh, tried it, I thought that uh, yeah. It looks uh, pretty uh, pretty cool for um, recreational. So maybe uh, this uh, poker room has a chance. And uh, then I left. I, I earned some money there. Actually, I, I did really great at like uh, 400 and 1 KNL. Back then, there were no 500. And um, so like in two years, uh, I heard about GG like everywhere. Uh, GG became really, really big. And uh, I saw that there are lots of uh, high stakes games. And uh, I kind of uh, just uh, changed my priorities, I would say. I thought that, that I should go for high stakes and uh, that it's probably a better option for me uh, to try to go to the top in cash games poker instead of uh, trying to do something with uh, the money I um, earned at the moment. So I just switched, basically, I would say. Mm. And GG is the main reason. You saw, so in the beginning, before GG, you saw more need in diversifying your portfolio, right? You mentioned investing in businesses, crypto, because you kind of felt yeah. like 2K was sort of a cap. When you then decided like, okay, high stakes, is now alive again. And I guess you then put it, your sole focus on reaching high stakes. How did that then change for you? How you approached uh, the game, but also, I guess, your professionalism around the game? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're right. That was like that. Um, at first, I took lots of uh, sessions with uh, really uh, tough guys uh, from Russian community. So I, I uh, spent some money on coaching. Uh, then um, I stopped trying to do lots of other stuff so I can focus on my main game. So I uh, finished with my investing time and uh, 
I basically just um, uh, decided that I would spend all of my time only in that direction. And uh, that was the uh, main reason. Um, I just decided and I put some hours in, uh, lots of hours actually. So I never spent that many hours on um, theory in poker because uh, yeah, I for sure I worked, but it wasn't that hard ever. But these um, two or maybe three years, uh, I spent lots of time uh, studying poker, playing poker, just observing poker, uh, play uh, watching like lots of YouTube poker and like poker poker. I would say that I'm leaving poker these three years. And I would uh, also say that uh, the best the best um, decision to achieve something in uh, this game is just to uh, decide that uh, you gonna leave this game. Mm. If you know what I mean. Yeah, like, if you're gonna, you, you just you, you, like you live the game, you brief poker twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. Before absolutely. that, when you had to divide your time and also your attention, I noticed this for myself personally as well. Like your brain then has to shift between tasks and between, for example, you were talking about investing, you were talking about crypto. So your brain every time has to switch games, so to speak, right? Whereas yeah, if yeah. if poker is all you think about, then your brain is not. Like, oh, we're we're poker players. We're we're doing poker, so it's easier to really go deep into into strategy before that I, I wanted to before we continue around this topic i wanted to ask you if you've ever been competitive in other sports or games prior to poker mm -hmm. yeah well actually um usually the case is um previously somebody uh, played like warcraft or dota but uh for me it's different um i didn't do any sports but uh well, actually, maybe that's a sport, but so when I was young, uh, like at my 12, it's not young, it's actually like teenage, uh, I did a lot of speed cubing. Well, actually, it's uh, so uh, it's uh, solving Rubik's Cube and not only Rubik's Cube, but other uh, cubes in time. Uh, as fast as you possibly can and there are uh, lots of uh, competitions in the world uh, on that so I did attend a lot of competitions in Russia, in Ukraine and I uh, in uh, Belarus I actually went to Thailand uh, first in my life uh, uh, at 2000 I don't know 10 or something like that uh, to attend in world uh, championship in speed cubing. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was pretty big part of my life. And I, uh, I enjoyed that. It was uh, really good times. And uh, I'm very grateful for that experience because it taught me a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, the main thing that I uh, learned from it is just the thought that everything is achievable and not like uh, just uh, this beautiful uh, phrase but uh, like a feeling you know mm. because I remember when I first uh, discovered speed cubing for myself I saw a video on YouTube where some uh, Japan Japanese guy uh, solved uh, the Rubik's Cube really fast bam, and uh, it was like eight seconds or so and i was very amazed and i felt like uh, he's just from some other planet it's uh, it's impossible but then i just uh, i got uh, some interest in that and i start uh, studying it start practicing 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 and in uh, i don't know three four years uh, later i i didn't even notice how it how um, it went but i realized that uh, i'm here right now and uh, it's easy for me to solve uh, rubik's cube just like that guy did and uh, yeah thank I, I i'm very grateful for that experience because uh, after that um i always feel really confident that if you put some hours in uh, you can achieve a lot in like everything 
yeah when you say when you like say few that it's achievable do you mean that like there's a certain confidence because for example i can see someone do something so i know that it's physically or you know it's possible but then i still need to have the confidence that i would be able to do it is that then what you mean with the feeling that it's possible that you have yeah. confidence in yourself that oh well if he can do in it myself, i can do it sure. yeah for sure in myself uh, i just uh, uh, realized that uh it's only about practicing and putting uh not only uh, practicing but practicing and uh, thinking about like living yeah i would say living just like i said uh, i lived poker for free uh, last years and uh, i lived speed cubing back, that back then for three or four years and uh, i managed to uh, win the russian championship for once actually so i can say that uh, in some period, I was the best uh, Russian speed cube uh, solver uh, in the whole country. And I uh, had lots of national records in uh, some uh, like different disciplines. Um, so there are lo lots of like two by two, three by four, four by four, five by five, and uh, so on. And I had some national records and uh, yeah, so it was achievable uh just because uh, i uh lived that i was really uh enjoying that i was practicing really a lot and uh, i was watching uh, stuff regarding that i was uh, um talking to other guys from forums and uh, stuff like that so uh actually it's <laughs> really uh, kind of the same now but uh, only that i'm almost 30 years old and uh, now it's poker but not speed cubing but it's pretty much the same i mean i'm sure i'm sure a lot of the listeners and me included we i, I have had a rubik's cube in my hand and i've spinned around a bit and like wait but if i spin the red to this side then now the other side is screwed up so i don't know if you maybe have like a rubik's cube nearby maybe you could give us a little a little starter tutorial how to fix a rubik's cube and maybe a little uh, little demonstration at the end as well um yeah so i actually every every time i have uh, one rubik's cube at my uh table so uh when like there are no games uh, i can just uh, turn it a bit like that just this to practice my fingers it's actually uh yeah you uh, you would be probably imagine uh, you wouldn't really imagine how fast it can get because right now, like the best guys in the world do like nine turns per second on the Rubik's Cube. That's like, what uh, the hell? that's like the best results. Uh, I mean, it's crazy fast. I'm not uh, even close uh, at uh, being that fast. But, well, if you're talking about how to solve it, uh, I would say that uh, it's not like I'm genius and uh, did that. I was just interested and I uh, watched uh, some YouTube tutorial and uh, that helped me to do it. It's not uh, that hard, actually. You just have to realize that uh, some parts of Rubik's Cube, um, they can't move. So they are just in their positions forever. It's like this middle um, mm -hmm. the center pieces um, so white would be always against yellow and like oh. green would be always against blue so you have to and uh, you you can do everything like every possible move you can do like uh, 200 moves and uh, oh. nothing would change white and opposite is yellow yeah mm. well, yeah Sorry. So knowing yellow's knowing that so that that's the start point that you know okay so white's always here yellow's always there so in your head you're already thinking okay well white yellow it's always going to be the opposite of each other yeah so and if you know that you just uh, basically start building um, uh, around this piece so this center is blue so uh, it would be blue. And I have just to build around the center pieces. And this one would be orange and green and red and so on. Yes, so, but then I get all the blues to the blue side. And then I feel relatively happy with myself. But then I turn the, turn the yeah. cube around. And then it's all of a mess, but on the other side. 
yeah and then you just open the youtube tutorial and you <laughs> you can manage to do it it's not that hard just uh, about practicing as well and then from there it's What's just not there's no there's no more involvement in strategy like okay the strategy is the same then whoever is faster with their fingers that then becomes sort of the edge no 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 it's not like that it's actually crazy hot when you go to speed cubing so it's i would say it's really easy to uh sorry to uh, be able to solve rubik's cube so i would say like probably every person who spent uh, like one maybe two hours in a really good youtube tutorial maybe i'm wrong maybe because it's easy for me right now maybe it's not like two hours maybe 10 but i would say like everybody would do it and me personally back in the uh, university when i was there and everybody was like amazed and uh, uh, asked if i can uh, taught them uh so i taught like 20 maybe 30 people around me everybody was possible to do it at the end mm -hmm. everybody absolutely no uh there are no uh i i don't remember this word sorry so no uh everybody would do it at the end so now you should have but, kept it to yourself man i can imagine you know you're at university you go to these university parties you bring your rubik's cube you say hey girls look what i can do uh, with yeah, my sure. rubik's cube you know <laughs> Yeah, it, it doesn't work like that. Actually. No, it's no uh, okay. It's 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 not a chick magnet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So and uh, if you go to the um, speed cubing, uh, when it's really hard because at first you have to learn a lot of stuff, lots of lots of algorithms, and um, you you should do lots of practice and, and basically um, to get really fast, you have to be able to look ahead. Look ahead is like, um, I don't know, it's like a world which um, would understand only speed cuber, but it's a very, very big part of speed cubing, uh, which, which is like, you have to be able to plan ahead lots of moves already so i'm doing something but i'm not thinking about that already because i should have thought about that previously now i'm thinking about what i would do next and the best cubers they are just uh, doing uh doing the solve basically with no pauses but uh their brain uh, would work like <laughs> it's it's really hard and uh, to to be able to solve rubik's cube in like 20 seconds you have to just uh, maybe 30 seconds okay you have to just uh, uh, learn some basic finger finger tricks so you you have to just realize that it's not about moving like that like would usual person do but it's uh, moving fingers like that mm. and then it be become fast but it's easy part so uh, and you can easily go to 30 seconds if you just uh, learn some algorithms and uh, do these finger tricks, practice them. But after that, it, it comes really, really hard. So to go from uh, solving Rubik's Cube in 20 seconds to go to solving it like in 10 or 12 seconds, uh, it can be years. Yeah. Oh, wow. So. So that's yeah. that that's top sport right there, right? In top sport, the, the edges are small. We're talking about milliseconds, so it's kind of the same as speed cubing. You already mentioned that like what you what speed cubing has taught you is that basically everything is possible if you put the time and effort into it. You you mentioned something interesting that uh in speed cubing or in solving a Rubik's Cube, it's very important to look ahead, to plan moves ahead. This actually sounds yeah. very similar to poker or, yeah. for example, to chess as well, right? Because your actions on, or if, we, if we're talking poker terms, your actions on the current street will have consequences to how the equities will line up on future streets. So you have to take in consideration runouts before you make your move on the flop, for example, because you're going to steer the hand in a certain direction, right? You're going to, you're going to try to, you're kind of basically going to isolate yourself against a part of Vinan's range and you have to think, Look ahead, how that's going to turn out on later street, and if that's going to be beneficial for you. Is is that one of the similarities that you found strategically? I yeah, guess. Yeah, sure. There are lots of uh, similarities actually, and even the environment uh, uh, behind it is uh, kind of similar because uh, 
these forums, these YouTube uh, videos, this um, the community about it, uh, all these competitions, because um, I have lots of flashbacks when I was young and I uh, go for some competition. I, I would uh, meet lots of people and we would be like friends, even if we don't know each other, because we, uh, we are really enjoying the same thing. And in poker, it's pretty much the same. So if I go to the poker uh, poker tournament right now, I would uh, uh, meet lots of people who are just loving uh, the game of poker. And uh, we would already have lots of things to discuss. Yeah, so lots of similarities, actually. And if you're talking about strategy, it's also kind of similar yeah, because you have to plan ahead and you have to take some responsibilities for for your actions. In cube, in the Rubik's cube, actually, there are lots of uh, difficulties uh, as well because, uh, like for example, your cube can just pop. So there is uh, you can you can uh, regular your tension on the sides. Mm -hmm. uh, do you understand what I mean? Like you, yeah, you, you, you can regulate one side to one yeah, color. Yeah. So uh in every probably I will be able to no, I'm not able to open it right now. Okay. So uh there is uh, um you can use screwdriver to uh mm -hmm. to regulate each side and uh, we are like uh at for formula one, so this is my bolid, you know? So it's my responsibility to um, prepare my cube right, you know? Do mm -hmm. lots of stuff like uh, tension, like uh, using some lube to lube it because uh, so it would turn that fast. You have to lube your cube. Oh, and... it's like cube, cube maintenance is very important as well because you bring your own yeah. new Rubik's Cube yeah. or when you go to a competition, you get handed. Yeah, for sure. Cube. Only only your own Rubik's Cube. Nobody would ever, ever go touch to the competition. Yeah. No, don't so... touch my Rubik's Cube. All right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There's such a thing, actually. Uh, and um, like in really prestigious competition in uh, World Championship, uh, somebody would be really mad if he uh, lost his cube, you know, because it's it's uh, lots of work already done, um, mm. and cubes are really different, and you uh, can adjust. Yeah, adjust that's work. You can adjust that the uh, cubes are different as well. So it's a lot of work uh, behind that as well. So it's uh, well. Lots of similarities in poker and uh, yeah, it, it, it in, feels a bit like, for example, in skateboarding or something, right? You have the actual act of skateboarding, but then you also have like the maintenance of your board, making sure the wheels roll quite smoothly. It seems quite similar in the in the Rubik's cube scene. Yeah, yeah. Could you maybe give us a little uh, a little a little demonstration of uh, of you solving uh, solving a Rubik's cube in uh, in speed in speed yeah, record sure. time? And, uh, I, I should. Um... Put it in front of the camera, yes, so, yes. So you see that, uh, yeah, probably this this is fine. So uh, at first, when uh, you have the competition, uh, you don't get your Rubik's Cube like that. You uh, get it covered, so I wouldn't see that. And uh, mm. I can prepare and say, like, yeah, I'm ready. And then uh, the judge would open my cube. And I have eight seconds to prepare the solve. What I mean by that is uh, when you are uh, speed cuber, you already have to plan lots of moves in eight seconds. And this eight seconds is actually also a thing which uh, differs lots of speed cubers because the best would um, plan ahead like 30 moves already, maybe, you know, 30 moves of, of your Rubik's cube in eight seconds. You just uh, understand that if I move like that, this would piece, this piece would go down and like that and so on. And you plan a lot, a lot, really a lot. I'm not that good, so I can plan only, I don't know, maybe 10 moves, but it's still something. So this eight seconds and then I go. Uh, 
Uh, it actually wasn't that uh, fast. I, I mean, think that, it was I like mean, it, it was like below ten seconds. seconds. Yeah, I think like around ten seconds. So that's. I think around eleven, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, I have, I had lots of practice, so I feel that time uh, pretty correct, uh, usually. And it it was pretty bad solve for me. Maybe I'm nervous. Uh, I usually do ten seconds. Uh, yeah, but still, that's. I mean, lots I mean, luck done for that. This this this, uh, this will get uploaded to a poker channel, so everyone will think you're a fucking genius. So don't worry. Like most yeah, of yeah, you, you upload sure. this to a cubing, you know, they're all gonna be like, oh, you know, your cubes loop isn't well looped, and you know, you use the wrong finger movement, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I don't know what kind of. But yeah. here on this channel, man, everyone will think you're a genius. So. C c congratulations. Yeah. Uh, how did you then transition into from Rubik cubing in? to poker i've heard you also use the word love for the game so why and when did you fall in love with the game of poker yeah um i switched because of money so uh i'm from pretty big family and we didn't have lots of money and it was fun to do that speed cuban but there is no money in it uh when even when i became a russian uh, champion uh, I was given like one thousand dollars, I think, something like that. So uh, it's not much. Well, it's it's kind of cool when you are really young, but uh, it's nothing uh, when you wanna be a grown up. So uh, I just had to quit it, and uh, I started to looking for some opportunities, and uh, uh, I'm back. I'm. I was born in a pretty small town uh, named Kursk and uh, I managed to get to the Moscow University and uh, lived in the dormitory and uh, we had lots of partying for sure there and uh, once a uh, friend of mine uh, he invited me to the party and said like we would play poker and uh, drink and uh, I said that uh, I never played poker and he said that he would uh, teach me and it's easy. Uh, I actually managed to scoop my first ever sit and go. And that's the moment when I fell in love uh, with poker for forever, I would say. I, I'm really, uh, there are lots of poker players uh, who uh, say when we discuss poker, like, yeah, poker is, uh, boring uh i hate poker i just have to put hours in so i would uh, get money back from it and like that but i'm not that type of guy i'm just loving the game i i fucking love the game i would say it even like that and uh, it wasn't it probably it was because uh i uh scooped my <laughs> ever tournament probably but i think uh, it's more like uh, it suits me really good because I'm like a gambler in my heart, but I'm like um, not a crazy gambler, so I cannot really uh, imagine that I would uh, sit at uh, like 40k NL having uh, 40,000. It's it's impossible for me, but uh, in every game I play, I try my best to win and uh, I get a lot of ple pleasure to trying to win uh, and uh, I enjoy the process of playing each game and uh, like back in the dormitory we, we had lots of different uh, like uh, games um, I, I don't remember uh, what how do you call it uh, like stand game I think I enjoyed playing uh, all of them i enjoyed studying them i enjoyed trying to get the edge in that in that so yeah i'm a, a gambler in in that and uh, back then in um when when i was uh, a kid i uh, did a lot of boxing so i did like five years of boxing and uh, uh, it also taught me some things like you have it's not about uh, how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit, stuff like that, which uh, uh, which is really cool words, but I, uh, I felt it a lot of times when I did boxing, because uh, yeah, I, I uh, got beaten 
a lot of my times, a lot of times in my life when I was a kid. And um, it's also, I think whole background um, helped me a lot so I can feel in poker like uh, it's my, my environment already. Mm. You know what I yeah, mean? You were, you like, were sort of, you I were came, sort of prepared for this. Yeah. Yeah. And whole my life, uh, like prepared me for, for that. So I wouldn't say that, um, it's, it's that, uh, I am so cool that I love the game and I'm like that lucky guy that has uh, a job, uh, which is not job, which is just like living a dream. I would say that I, I got lucky that, it's the case for me, but, mm. but it's the case. So I, I love poker, but it's not about me. It's about the environment I uh, grew up in. I think it's like that. So, so when did you yeah. then decide to, to <laughs> you were studying in the Moscow university, when did you transition into playing poker professionally or was it a decision um, or did it just sort of happen? Yeah, it was a decision decision for sure. So um, at the first uh, year in my university, already I um, realized that I should take this opportunity living in Moscow, not to finish my university great, but to uh, manage to find good work, uh, some good relationships and and stuff like that. So uh, I was really, really bad at the university. If you talk about studying, um, I actually was really close uh, to get expelled uh, like two or three times, but I did try a lot of stuff um, to earn money. So, and uh, when I discovered poker for myself, I already um, did uh, some, I would say like, uh, Mm. So I, I tried uh, some other stuff, but at that moment, uh, I already was able to earn some money uh, doing some betting on um, betting sites. Mm -hmm. uh, like sports so, betting, you mean? Yeah, sports betting, but but it was not about... Uh, basically, I wouldn't care which sport uh, I'm uh, betting on and which team. Uh, nothing like that. I would just uh, care about numbers. And if you count fast and well, you can see the opportunities to earn some money mm. uh, without any uh, variance, you know? Mm. But, but so it's like, uh, I don't know uh, what what's uh, the name uh, for um, that strategy in English, but I, I, I think for sure uh, lots of people uh, would understand what I'm saying. In Russian language, it's uh, Vilka i Koridor. So Vilka i Koridor, two, like, okay. Yeah, these two strategies. And um, you basically see the uh, holes in um, betting, in the, uh, in the numbers odds? of betting sites. Yeah, in odds, yeah. So mm. you, you see the holes and you use these holes to... Uh, How bet. does one see the yeah. holes? If you do, like, for example, if you don't understand the sport, then it, it has nothing to do with the sport. It's pure. Yeah, I don't care which sport I'm betting. Yeah, it's it's only about odds. You have to be able to calculate fast, and you have to be prepared. So you would. This is just the strategy. I I um I found a guy who earned some money in um in our dormitory, and he had like lots of money, and he was uh living cool life, and I was. Not poor, but I, I was from family which uh, didn't have that much money. And when I uh, came to Moscow, I realized that I, I should uh, earn money myself. So um, I was trying to uh, find something. And when I uh, met this guy, I, I, I said, like, uh, uh, please teach me and I would uh, pay you back later. Like, uh, <laughs> it's actually funny because it's it was like coaching for profit. <laughs> Yeah, just like in poker. And I did, it was my first ever coaching for profit. And um, he uh, did uh, teach me and I paid him back like $2,000 actually. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And it was on my, it was at the end uh, of my 
maybe second year in the university. Yeah, and uh, so I was able to earn some money when I discovered poker and I was uh, doing that thing. Uh, earning some money, having parties uh, like that. I was pretty okay at the moment, but uh, I was thinking that I should um, take poker really serious because uh, I love the game. And uh, this sport betting thing, it's uh, it's kind of silly. It's uh, You can't really work with that, in my opinion. It's uh, very... Uh, like um, it's pretty boring and uh, there is no uh, any creativity in that. You just uh, mm. play with numbers uh, and if you put some hours, you would get some money. And it's th there is actually, uh, you cannot actually earn really a lot um, amounts of money because all of the betting sites, they, they know that there is such a thing mm. and they would... Uh, struggle against that they would ban you and uh yeah so i was consistently getting banned uh, on uh some sites i switched to another sites and stuff like that so uh yeah i was earning pretty good for student but uh i know i knew for sure that i wouldn't um uh, just stay in that um in that uh, taking that as a work i would say mm -hmm. so um then i tried to do poker and i uh, uh tried to to play seed and goals then i tried to play cash games uh, uh one and another and uh, i didn't have much success then um all of these uh, betting things uh, they went pretty bad because i i got banned pretty much from everywhere and uh, so I was already um, in a habit of spending pretty lot amount of uh, money and having parties and I enjoyed that life and I didn't even notice how all of my money was gone because um, I usually, uh, it was really easy for me to earn back but then I realized that I cannot earn back because I'm banned everywhere and <laughs> Uh, all of my money was gone because I was uh, living pretty good life, I would say, in the dormitory. So I had to go uh, take poker seriously. And uh, actually, I would say that all this, I knew that I would do that. I was just, uh, I was just partying and like a bit later, yeah, a bit later, like one, a, a year or so. Um, and actually, because I spent all of my money and uh, I, I didn't get any money from my um, parents. That was my decision. I uh, said it's in the first year of my university. So please don't send me anything. It's, uh, it's me who has to take this responsibility. Actually, also because uh, when I uh, mean parents, I mean only my mom. So my uh, dad died when I was young. And... Uh, my mom already did lots of stuff so uh i felt like uh i can't really take any money from her it would be uh, like a really bad thing for growing up so um back to this moment uh when uh there is a crisis in my life i'm trying to do poker but i cannot i'm playing like uh, mm, i i think i'm playing uh, like around zero because I uh, love the game and I spent lots of hours watching YouTube videos, some tutorials, stuff like that. And I wasn't that bad, I, but I couldn't earn money already um, at that moment. So uh, that was a tough period in my life. I even had to take some loan, you know, yeah, from a friend of mine and then uh, from another friend. And uh, well, we came the moment then uh, I had some uh, loans and I don't have any money and it was really tough times and um, actually to uh, jump, uh, to take a jump um, in poker, I had to go to the like a regular job. First, I uh, go work like a promoter at the um, 
entrance of uh, subway i was just uh, promoting some shit and uh, yeah th this actually great experience because i realized uh, that i was taking money too easy like you know, you're taking so it for money... granted that yeah, the money yeah. with the sport okay. betting came in so easily yeah 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 absolutely um sorry i'm not that good speaker uh but i understand everything you say so uh, please help me with some words uh when you get no worries, the... no worries. yeah i i took everything for granted that's a good phrase uh if you talk about my money career and uh, then um i met a friend of mine who uh explained me about one also work which uh which is uh, promoting but not that uh it's promoting in schools it was pretty hard to get this job and I did lots of work to get the job and I finally uh, got it and it was pretty good job um, and I did it only to take some money so I can uh, have a jump in poker so I can uh, spend some money in poker and having money uh, on the side to live on and uh, when I get this job uh, I spent all of my money all of my effort on poker and doing this job and it was uh, for half a year and I managed to earn enough so I could live on that and uh, pay all of the loans and uh, on the side I was uh, trying to do my best at poker uh, and then was a moment I um, managed to do pretty pretty good in that job and I was earning like Three thousand dollars per per month, something like that. So it was pretty good um, at that moment. And um, uh, my boss uh, told me that I'm doing good and I can uh, go for like a bigger advantage. And uh, um, I really remember this moment. So I, I told told her that uh, I'm not here for that. I'm here only for money. Uh, I want to go play poker. I always actually wasn't uh, afraid to say that uh, I would like to go play poker because I know lots of guys, they uh, would say that they are working in IT or something like that. I would always say like, I'm playing poker. I want to go play poker. Poker is fun <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, I told her that... Um, I want to quit to play poker. And she said that uh, actually we would like to rent for you and our good uh, guys, uh, really good uh, flat uh, in the center of Moscow. It was like crazy good back then. Uh, so they, you can live here, live there and do the job. And please mm -hmm. just uh, go there. If you like it enough, you probably would stay. And uh, I went there, it was on Arbat Street. It was like a really big flat. And at that time, me being from my family, I was like, oh my God, there are such a good flats, such a big one. It's, it was really cool. And I really remember uh, this moment because uh, I spent the night there. We were partying and having fun. And in the morning, um, I woke up really early and um, I said to other guys, who actually also know, knew about poker. I said, no, 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 for sure. I'm going for poker. And I took all of my stuff, go to my boss and say, you know what? Thank you a lot, but I'm going for poker right now. And I uh, went to a really small room, which I lived in and started playing 50 ml Zoom. And I was fucking happy with that. I was just so happy that I decided to go for poker. And at that moment, my bankroll was 1,500 and I just switched to um, um, five, uh, NL 500, uh, NL 50, oh, not 500, NL 50, NL 50 Zoom poker. And I was just enjoying doing that. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was the start of my career. And after that, I never did anything but poker. Uh, for, for a job did you have any you mentioned with the rubik cubing you I think you mentioned like a japanese guy you saw f fixing a rubik cube in like five seconds or something on youtube and you were like hey so that's possible did you have any role models like in poker or was it just you had trust in yourself like hey this is this is a thing 
and I'm just going to make this work? Or did you have like a role model that you could look up to? Like, hey, these people are doing it as well, so I can do this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that I ever had a role model, but uh, I would say for sure that I spent a lot of hours uh, just reading uh, some blogs of other people. I, I have to mention for Haley, I have to mention uh, Invoker and uh, Stefan. So these guys, uh, the guys who motivated me a lot, uh, mostly Stefan, because he actually came to the top, um, was coming to the top basically at the moment when I started my career uh, like that. So when I started, he already was pretty good. And uh, during my career, he was becoming better and better, better. And uh, one thing I love about Stefan is that he is so straightforward guy. He would always tell the whole truth in his blog. Like, I'm feeling uh, really bad because I'm just such a shit and stuff like that. So he was just so, he was really honest. And uh, so for Haley, it was like really beautiful picture in his blog. He is just so good uh, like that. He he didn't try, he didn't do anything to look so cool, but uh, it's just his style. He looked really cool in his blog. And in Walker, he looked like fun and cool but stefan would feel just like a brother like like he is just in the same struggle as you mm. and he had like uh i think um really really important post uh, for me is about him he talking about his first ever huge downswing because he was always like a huge crusher he would crush at eight bbs or so um and once he had a pretty big downswing losing like um, i think forty thousand dollars or something playing basically 400 600 and um, he did lots of posts regarding that and um, uh, these were the posts which i came back to even now um uh, I actually read it once, one more time uh, last year. Mm. Uh, but I'm playing much higher than Stefan was playing at that moment, but they still motivate me a lot, especially knowing uh, what he did after. So yeah, Stefan is for sure, probably the role model would be him, but I cannot say that he was a role model because we are just so different. Mm. Um, but he yeah, at least was are... he at least was a motivating a motivation that again showed you that despite times being hard, there is a light in the end of the tunnel because like you said you know you know where he came where he where he ended up uh, going and if you read that post you know that in the end it's gonna be all right so you see all the shit that he's been going through mm -hmm. you feel like shit but you know hey listen he he managed to turn it around and so will I yeah but. Actually, at that moment, with uh, he he didn't already achieve everything. Mm -hmm. So when I first read it, he wasn't that good. But I was just so so sure that he would he would do it at the end because of his uh, his attitude. Is just Stefan is just so crazy about this game. Um, I think like. The best explanation about Stefan and probably the best uh, reason why is he so creative and uh, uh, tough to play against is he just doesn't care about money at all. Uh, I think like, and at the same time, which is so uh, incredible that he is actually so um, like a reasonable guy. When you met him, he read a lot. He... Uh, like practice a lot, do meditation, stuff like that, all of that. But when he is on table, he is just like doesn't care about money at all. Yeah. And um, he just cares about competition. Not even poker, but competition in poker, like intelligence competition, something mm -hmm. like that. And yeah, I really love that in him. So he's just so uh, 
he doesn't feel afraid as like he doesn't feel afraid that he would uh, go broke or something he just doesn't doesn't uh, think in that way but um, me for example when uh, i am at the tables the um, main struggle for me is that i always um, scared that uh, i can go broke that uh, some things can go bad so probably i shouldn't bluff here because i just uh, will uh, burn my money right now and stuff like that i uh, actually uh, i know that i uh, watched lots of youtube videos from you and you always say that you have uh, to think about your nature and uh, uh, you uh, you told that your nature is pretty like passive so you mm -hmm. should um pick more aggressive options and like always remember about that and i think most of uh, people coming to poker are uh, natively very passive and mm -hmm. very scared and stefan is the opposite yeah and th that's why he can't really be my role model because we are such uh, different guys but for sure um I I respect him a lot and uh, I really like um, the whole uh, journey of him in poker and uh, I was lucky enough to to be like uh, to be during the journey uh, close enough to read all the posts and uh, to meet him in life and uh, to talk about strategy at, at, and poker so yeah yeah actually i remember uh, that uh i remember actually that i actually had one post from stefan as well a long time ago that that i translated to english and that i remember i used in one of my coaching sessions and i think it was i think it was when i'm trying to remember predators? what the post was it, sorry maybe about predators sorry to no it, it, it i think it was something about like uh stepping into like your curiosity of the game and just freeing mm -hmm. yourself up and just doing yeah. whatever what wh whatever comes natural to you be really being intuitive i think it was like a post when he he wasn't enjoying poker that much and then suddenly he break he break through and it's like listen i'm now f really curious about the game again i'm interested i'm creative when i just let uh, let the game flow when I have no more expectations. It was it was something, and I'm I'm throwing out yeah. a lot of topics right now, but it was something along along those lines. Maybe I, I'll put it in the description for people who are interested. Yeah. Maybe maybe if I can find it back somewhere. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Quick reminder: Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program is currently open for enrollment, and we've put together the biggest promotion ever: 25% off on the program and three bonuses worth close to 3,000 euros of free value. Enrollment is open for the first couple of weeks of January before we close the program permanently. So don't miss out. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com. Sign up now and let me and Adam help you achieve your poker goals in 2024. I wanted to actually switch it over to Adam now. He's been silently uh, patient, like he always is. Patient guy. <laughs> uh, on the other side, like, we were talking about... Uh, he was, um, uh, Nikolai was talking about risk aversion, right? That naturally people are risk averse and that's you actually see this back in like data, for example, of population that's usually the general tendency is to be more risk averse, more passive under bluff over fold, especially if you look at lower stakes, like at higher stakes, people have overcome these bias, or I guess naturally the people are less risk averse. They rise to the top. Maybe that's the case. What can people do to be less risk averse? Tough question. Well, yeah, I think it's first of all important to know your tendencies and how risk averse you generally are. As you mentioned, most of us have somewhat passive tendencies. We go away from risk rather than into risk. And we like to hold on to our resources of money and what we have. And we don't like putting on the line and, and to, to, to lose nets. And generally for most people, losing feels twice as bad as winning feels good. So just know those things about yourself. Just understand, okay, um, risk um, feels challenging for me. And that's going to hold me back if I don't go head to head with it. So uh, 
what I get players to do is basically um, understand in which areas do you feel your passive natures or your aversion to risk are holding you back. So Nikolai mentioned like basically scared of losing money and that could impact you in many ways. That could impact you shot taking. That could impact um, you playing during a downswing. So uh, try to look at the where those tendencies show up and try to really fight back against those tendencies. So realizing like, what is it you're scared of with risk? Because often it's quite primal, right? So if you look at risk and why we're afraid of it, we like hardwire like money into our survival needs. If I lose money, like Nikolai mentioned, go broke. Going broke feels like I'm dead, game over, like life's over for us. So um, we build this really strong primal attachment to our resources. So we've we really got to do some work unpacking like why we're so attached to money, why we're so attached to resources, and then going head to head with it and creating almost like little controlled experiments where you take on more risk, where you challenge yourself to step into risk. But this is a challenge for many players. I haven't really got like a, a one sentence answer other than to understand your tendencies and then to learn to step to more and more risk and realize that we can build tolerance. I can't say everyone can become a Stefan and not care about money, but you can learn to acquire more tolerance for risk. I'm sure Rene, yourself and Nikolai and anyone listening, when you first started your poker career, the stakes you're probably playing now, the swings you have day to day, you couldn't imagine that was possible that you'd be okay going to bed at night going, yeah, you just lost 10K, life's good. You're older self. So you can build a tolerance over time. Uh, but yeah, you've got to yeah, kind of step in into that nature. So yeah, I really enjoyed your story, Nikolai. Really fascinating listening to how you've developed a mindset going into poker. And we've got the story so far. You're currently just going into your poker career and playing 50 NL. So uh, could you tell us about some of the early, um, maybe goals you had coming into poker when you first started getting got curious about the game? And yeah, how did you start to progress from your initial curiosity into becoming a good winner? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, thanks a lot for uh, everything you just said because you um, summarize it really, really good, I think. And this um, phrase, understand uh, your, uh, what you said, sorry. Uh, you have to understand your um, uh, your nature, your tendencies. Yeah, your nature, your, your tendencies. Yeah, understand your tendencies. That's that's a really big thing in poker. And actually, if I would uh, have to tell uh, to give an advice, I would say that you have to understand your tendencies and reflect on that a lot. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you wanna have a breakthrough moment. It's about understanding and going against it and building that confidence to uh, go against it, against your nature. Okay, so uh, as for me, back then playing NL50, I think um, firstly, I was just uh, really in love with the game and I was uh, just uh, playing a lot and uh, I always wanted to go uh, at their biggest stake was always like my goal and uh, I think it's just uh, luck that uh, I always wanted to go up because lots of people feel uh, comfortable enough at a pretty low stake and I think that's that's a big bad thing because poker uh, is a really tough job and i think probably it's also a dangerous job we just don't have um, a big sample enough yet to realize how dangerous it can be i mean with uh, us sitting there having lots of stress uh, moments and um, uh, having to deal with a lot of uh, nervous moments when you just uh, have to um, ship like uh, lots of money on the river and uh, the guy tanks uh, and you are just uh, please fault like that so lots of um probably danger in poker i think and uh just like i said i i love the game but i understand that uh it's not a really good job and it's not a, a dream job so um what, what I'm saying is that if you feel that you are comfortable enough playing like an L50, probably it's not a good thing. Uh, probably you either go up or you just quit poker, as rude as it, uh, as rude as it sounds. Um, because, yeah, um, I think it's very bad to spend all of uh, your best years when you are so uh, you can be so focused, you have lots of mental and uh, physical strain. Um, you, you have lots of energy and 
uh, you have lots of opportunities, uh, lots of time, everything uh, during your 20 to like 30. And to just spend that playing an L50, uh, sorry, but I think it's not a good choice. And um, I always, when, when somebody um, asks me, uh, like, uh, what should I do? I'm playing in L50. I, I always say like you should go up. You you should just uh, try to go bigger stakes and poker. Uh, if you talk about cash poker, and I'm a cash poker uh, player, um, it starts only on 200 and now I would say. Uh, before that, it's just uh, you shouldn't really think that it's uh, your job yeah for sure you can be from small town and uh, in russia lots of uh, small really uh, poor towns and uh, one thousand dollars in the town is just crazy lots of money but uh still i think these years when you are so good young and productive probably it's better to spend that on some different um different opportunities, different job. So, yeah, I was lucky that for some reason I always wanted to go uh, on the bigger such stake. And um, actually, I would say that uh, back then uh, I was a bit like Stefan, but not because of my nature. It's just because I was so... Um, I, I really wanted to go bigger I actually, uh, lots of my sessions were like, I'm playing L50, uh, I'm feeling tired, I'm done. And I would open an L100 Zoom and I would like watch it forever till I wanna go sleep. And I would just uh, preparing for playing this stake. Uh, I would take some notes. I would just, uh, you know, spend uh, time watching it, observing it and uh, I did same all of my career actually when I moved to 100 NL I was just so focused on getting to 200 NL I was shot taking a lot and all this was just thinking about that I wasn't really thinking about oh I just finally made 10,000 uh, K and uh, I would I want to just spend it no I, I was always like okay it's enough to go show taking 200 NL right now uh, and I think it's uh, only luck that uh, I'm in such um, in such I was in such mode. Mm -hmm. um, but here now I'm realizing that it's very important that you should be in that kind of mode if you want to achieve something in poker, because if you want to just uh, basically um, be able to earn two thousand uh, dollars in poker and that's like a dream. Uh, yeah, probably mm, you should try to do something else. Mm. As Ruth says, as it's yeah, we, yeah. I agree on, on all levels with that. And what do you think was driving you to want to play higher? So uh, myself, I can definitely relate to always looking at the level above and it's almost like the next ladder to go to. And what's really nice about online poker in particular, there is like a clear level system. There's the next level, which normally the double the buy-in and you just keep progressing and progressing to the, the really higher stakes. So um, for you, your, your goal was always to keep climbing that ladder. Was that driven by a nature of competition against better opponents? Were you trying to fulfill some sort of innate feeling good about yourself and showing to yourself you could be good at this game? What was driving this always quest to want to go to that next level? Yeah, just like I mentioned, I, I think I was just lucky. And the whole environment I grew up in, uh, it, it made me uh, like that. So, um, I, the, um, the thing is, I, I didn't even think why I want to go. I just, it was just like the only way to go, you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because of my environment. Yeah, just like you mentioned, uh, uh, this competition feeling in me, uh, compet being competitive, um, wanting to try to, to achieve something else and then something else as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's only about my environment I grew up in and that's, that's it. It's just uh, the whole, uh, my experience before made me like that. And it's, uh, I feel like 
that I'm lucky to be like that. And that's actually the reason which helped me a lot back then, because I managed to achieve pretty reasonable states, uh, actually really fast. And I, uh, I don't even remember me playing like an L25, an L50, an L... Well, I know 100 Zoom, I played uh, some sample, but most of the limits were uh, gone. Um, and I don't even remember playing that. Uh, I remember me playing 400 to 1K, now a lot. That, that was a big part of my career, but I wasn't playing uh, really low uh, for a long period of time because I was just crazy about uh, going up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want you to take us back to uh, a low moment. You mentioned earlier that it was inspiring to hear Stefan's blog of him going through a, a really tough time. And I think the story you have uh, for your bad times as well can also inspire other people listening. So uh, there was a time in your career, I think it was when you're playing 400 to 1Ks, where you were 100 buy-ins under EV and your wife is pregnant at the time. Yeah. Take us back to that time and what was going on. Yeah. That that's a very very tough time in my poker career for sure that uh, would be uh, the toughest time with like really really big distance between uh, the second one so uh, i already did uh, play lots of offline poker i i went uh, to play in sochi and uh, um i um so I met lots of people, and uh, back then I met uh, Viktor Kudinov, who is uh, thus uh, 91, and you had him on, on the pod, and I think that was a great pod, and thank you very much for that, because I know Viktor pretty good, and he never uh, was so open about his poker career as he was on your pod, so thank you for that a lot. And yeah, I met Victor and we, I wouldn't say that we were ever friends and we are not friends now, but we always were in a good relationship. And um, um, was a period my, of my life. I was playing 400 to 1K. It was, actually was a really big period of my poker career. I, I, I feel like I always played, played these limits. And... Um, I just uh, had pretty bad downswing, which uh, I was running lots of uh, under EV. It was like a hundred uh, um, points under EV. And uh, also I, I know now, and uh, I'm sure now that I was playing too bad and too passive in that time because it was the first time and uh, uh, was really hard to not to, uh, to become a, a bad player at that moment. So I think uh, uh, you have to understand that when you have a huge downswing, the struggle is not about lose not that much money and like uh, stuff like that. The struggle is not about losing too much of your win rate, I would say. Because like... Uh, Usually when you have five uh, BBs win rate, you can play like two BBs or even lower when you have huge downswing. And you have to think about that constantly when you are in the downswing. The, the main goal for you right now is not to lose your win rate. Uh, so it's about uh, strategy. I mean, also you have to do lots of mental uh, things, but I, I'm not uh, talking about that right now. Uh, if you talk about strategy things, you have not to lose your win rate in that moment because it's easy to lose that. You you just uh, skip some uh, spots, you just not bluff, you just not call, stuff like that, and then you just ruin your win rate and the streak can go forever because you are not 5DB player anymore. You are 1DB player right now. And yeah, well, good luck. With that so i think at that time i had like five or six bbs at pretty big sample so i was pretty good player but uh when i first hit this downswing it was really 
big downswing and actually my wife just got pregnant and lots of stuff uh, on the side and um, it was tough for me to maintain the POC level at the tables and I'm sure that I lost a lot of my win rate there. Um, so that's why actually this downswing was uh, going for that big period of my life. It was, I think it was like half a year. And uh, I mentioned Victor uh, because he helped me a lot in that period. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we discussed a lot of poker, but, and not so about strategy poker, but poker environment. And um, he, uh, told me like really good and uh, important words back then. And I'm grateful for that. It wasn't uh, something special and crazy. It wasn't like a strategic moment which uh, switched my life. Uh, no, it was just uh, basically being uh, the poker friend, uh, poker mate, because nobody else would understand me that good as he at that moment. Um, he also, um, uh, his, his son is a uh, one year, um, one year more than mine, uh, one year older. Yeah. So he just basically was in the same situation before me and he understand me really good. And also he was a be a better player, uh, than me and him saying like, you're good enough. You, you will go through that. You just uh, you just chill, brother. Uh, if if it goes really bad, uh, I can stake you and you can play. Uh, so just don't worry. And all of these these uh, words they were really important at that moment. And uh, I uh, to get through that, I realized that I should probably just um, take this win rate thing back. And to have the confidence back, I uh, went back to 200 NL, which I, I didn't play for a lot of for a long period. Uh, mainly I was playing higher, but I went to 200 NL and uh, I was basically just uh, doing lots of reg wars, even heads up. Uh, I was playing with no select, absolutely, uh, no. So I, I play. I would play like everyone on 200 NL because I was confident enough in that games. And I think that it was a really good decision to go there because I'm sure that at that moment I was a really bad player in uh, higher limits. But on 200, I was like, come on, uh, you will be destroyed for sure. That That's a, a big daddy right here. And uh, yeah, I, I did great on 200 NL. Uh, I think... Uh, lots of that uh, regarding to uh, having upswing, but uh, actually also I think I was good enough player. So I just um, managed to do like nine BBs or something, uh, playing lots of tables uh, like everyone, and I played. I don't remember exactly, maybe two hundred or three hundred hands, uh, earned some money and some confidence, uh, went back, and um, yeah, it was really tough but very important lesson in my life. Mm. And yeah, this is very actually, important. The really funny thing is that now I'm grateful for that, mm. even though it was really hard. And um, I'm not sure, but I think uh, there were moments then I even cried. I'm not sure, but probably, I, I don't remember exactly, but, but I think... I was really close and maybe I even cried one uh, or two times. And you have to understand that uh, in Russia, a uh, man cannot cry. It's, uh, oh, no, 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 it's not a man. You never cry, you just go through it and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was really tough, but now I'm grateful for that because it taught me a lot. And uh, now when I can just uh, reflect on that, I think um, it's a big and important lesson. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think life teaches you lessons through, through challenges. And 
Yeah, it was really important what you said there as well, which I want to double back on, where you mentioned during a downswing, it's important not to lose your win rate. And this is really crucial because, as you mentioned, you were 100 buy-ins under EV for this long period. I think you mentioned six months. But your win rate going into that, into that downswing changes as you go through it. So you mentioned being a 5BB winner, but as you're going through that downswing, all of a sudden you're losing confidence, you're being more passive, or your tendencies that are, your negative tendencies are getting magnified, emotions are there, you're not playing the same game. So all of a sudden, like what was variance to begin with, now is getting compounded because your win rates now went to 2BB or 1BB or even negative in extreme scenarios. So um, I'm really curious to know like the lessons you've learned from that or, or how do you maintain your win rate during a downswing. If I could say that you're right, you're going to keep your 5BB win rate and just keep playing and it'll even out. I think most people will be like, oh my God, thank you. Yes, I would. I'll keep playing through it. But the, the challenge is, am I still winning? Do I still have a 5BB yeah. win rate? So for you, how do you, what do you do going forward now in your career to uh, maintain your win rate during times of low confidence? Yeah, uh, I'm really... Um... I'm really grateful that we are discussing that right now because um, if I can help poker professionals, uh, probably it's uh, that uh, that that thing about not losing your win rate in your downswings because it's like a huge huge part of your career. And if you if you want to go for the top results, uh, you have to work a lot on that. So right now, as for me, I, I just realized that. Um, it's really important to rest and um, well, I love the game, like I mentioned, and it's not easy for me, but I have to take a week off or each, each week I have one uh, day off and I have to do it. Uh, lots of times I'm like, oh, I, I feel great. I want to play, but no, no, I have to take a day off. And um, like in two or three months, I would always take three or five uh, days off. And yeah, um, uh, I'm trying. I would try to uh, explain it as good um, uh, as I uh, can. But it's a very important thing. So, uh, like I see it, is that. Let's say you have 5BB win rate. If you don't uh, rest, if you just play, 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 uh, for sure, because you are a human, your win rate would go down. The more you play, uh, the more it would go down, for sure. I, I think it's not, um, it's impossible to just maintain your win rate playing like uh, 100 days with no break. So, I think um, taking this um, uh, rest is really important so you can focus uh, not from not on money but on your strategy on the game because when you play a lot uh, just being a human you you would start to think about money uh, it's always like that um, especially if you have downswing um, so, at some moment, you would be like money, 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 money. If you don't even realize it, but it's like uh, surrounding you. And to take this off, you have to rest. Um, when you rest and you came back to the poker tables, you you are already um, like bored enough. You you wanna go play. You wanna battle. Uh, because uh, poker is so emotional game and uh, just uh, as human brain works uh, you would uh, want to get these emotions uh, back and uh, you would even feel it uh, that you really want to get it back so uh, when you have a rest and you uh, go back um, from a rest to poker tables uh, I think you are in like best shape as as um, as crazy as it sounds. I, I even think that um, so we discussed that with uh, Victor Kudinov and um, so we uh, came back to the this, to to the conclusion that if uh, we take poker 
player right now who is already good enough, let, let's say a 1k rec. Uh, and um, he would just quit poker right now for month or two months or three months. When he came back, it takes like two weeks for him to uh, be able to play as good again. But the funniest thing is that he probably would play even better than he was previously. Because the more you play, uh, the worse your uh, focus on the game and the more you're focusing on other stuff and you can even get bored and like uh, watch YouTube, uh, sound, uh, uh, so some music and uh, would uh, chat with friends because you're already too bored. You, you play it a lot and it's like, blah, blah, blah. It's uh, the same, the same routine. And uh, to get to that level when you are in the game completely and you focused really, really well, uh, you have to take rest. So uh, actually, I remember that in 2018, uh, I was at that period of my career with, when I uh, didn't do any breaks. So I would have a day off only if I'm ill and if I'm ill bad, because if I'm just uh, feeling a bit weak, it's okay. I can just play like lower, let's say. And uh, um, I had my first big uh, trip to Bali and with um, with a girlfriend uh, who became my wife after. And I thought like I should I should take my laptop. So so I play every day, at least one hour or so, because I have to maintain my poker um, poker shape. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say like that? So, and uh, I, I did manage to play every day, absolutely every day. Uh, and now I feel absolutely different about that. I think that uh, it's not that easy as you think to lose your poker shape. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you have a rest, you're doing better for your poker game. Um, because brain is pretty complex uh, yeah it, it's um, lots of things would um, are really important when you play poker L lots of things lots of small details are really important and um, I think every player, player would agree that uh, you can if there is a scale like uh, 0 to 100 your play every day would uh, differ a lot so you can play at 50, uh, you can play at 70, you can play at 90, or you can play at 100. And yeah, win rate is really different in these periods. So to be able to play your best uh, and uh, not to be scared, not to be, um, not to think about money too much, not to think about uh, which period are you in, how big the downswing is and stuff like that. Uh, it's only able when you are interested in your poker game as a strategic game, like there is no money behind it. You just wanna play, you just wanna, you just wanna destroy your opponent. You just wanna level up him. Uh, you just wanna understand how he thinks so it's only about competition. When, when it's like that, uh, you don't want to uh, like play YouTube on the side of your screen, right? You 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 want to be in the hand. You wanna you wanna be really um, focused on on that. So yeah, I think rest rest and having day offs is really really important in your poker career. And now I uh, I feel different about that and i so i have uh, like a pretty hard routine um like uh, no i have like a schedule right so and it's i cannot really move away from that schedule a lot and i even even if uh, let's say that there is a really good game right now 
I think like I can so easily lose my win rate at some moment so that all of my hours which I put in uh, like worth zero, you know, like let's say your win rate is uh, five, uh, five BBs. If you are in not such a good shape, it becomes four BBs. If you are on your best shape, it's like six, six BBs or maybe seven BBs. Uh, those are just approximate numbers. The thing I want to say is that sometimes when you feel like, no, I should play a bit more, probably these bit more hours are worth zero because you just lose them because uh, on the bigger picture, you play worse, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I... I um i see that uh, like that so you you should try to maintain uh and uh, i'm not that guy who says like if you play you play only a game right you if you don't feel like a game just quit the tables no no it's it's different it's about being able to maintain the best you can but if you have like let's say i did the mistake i'm not uh, breaking my session it's fine all of the mistakes are already on my uh, win rate result. It's absolutely fine. It's just uh, just the process. But um, if I don't do any breaks, if I just keep playing poker, I I'm pretty sure that I would lose my win rate. And uh, playing like hundred hours or playing hundred fifty hours can be the same at the result, but you could spend these 50 hours much better than just playing poker for like zero amount, you know? And um, also I think that practicing in poker is very important and actually it's important in uh, any other, uh, in any other part of life. Practicing is, uh, it's, it's all about practice, but uh, I think in poker you have uh, to take some rest. It's mm. yeah. Um, I hope that I um, I explained good enough because um, that's like a, that's like a really big thing which I would like to share to um, our poker professionals who maybe uh, already in the state of mind like I should just play 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 play. It's it's a bit more complicated than you think. Yeah. yeah. And actually, uh, when I started to uh, take some rest uh, and like, you know, reload your uh, poker brain, mm -hmm. um, I find myself a lot in the situations when uh, I'm like, oh, I can do like that and probably it would work like that, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm playing such a great hand, which I never played. And I don't know why I came up with that. But when I take this rest, uh, my brain is work, it works in a pretty different state uh, with all the poker, poker environment, poker videos, poker studies, all of that poker, poker, poker. Um, which is in my life and it's just like mm, consolidates sorry yeah your mind consolidates the information that you've been yeah, absorbing yeah yeah Cons that's a good word right now yeah yeah mm -hmm. exactly so when you take rest um and even better is uh you take rest and after going back to the tables uh before that you do some study um you rest, you study, and you go to the tables and you would crush. Uh, I can tell you for sure, uh, you would crush. Yeah, that, that's uh, uh, best ever advice I could possibly get. Yeah. Mm. Uh, if, if somebody would uh, tell me that um, deep enough that I would understand it and I would feel it, I would be in a uh, much, much better poker uh, situation right now, for sure. I think it's great advice. And the way you were talking about it, I was trying to visually think about as you're playing more and more hours, your win rate kind of getting less when you're not taking breaks. And then a, a, a break kind of resets your win rate. It almost gets it back yeah, to where absolutely. it was. 
And I think that's really important to know, like as a high performer who wants to get more out of yourself, that you can't just keep logging in hours day after day without recovery or your win rate will start to drop. So you need to like fit into recovery, into a system to allow yourself to get back and reset your kind of win rates back to where they were. But also, as you mentioned, when you take breaks, you don't just go back to baseline. You regain curiosity because you're playing every day. You get a bit more bored and mundane. But when you take breaks, you come back with fresh ideas and your brain also learns and consolidates information when we're doing other things, when we're not in the act of doing something during recovery time in, in particular. So uh, and there's also like an adaptive response of team recovery. So yeah, I, I was the same because myself, I did supernova elite volume for two years in a row. There was one year where I played 335 days of 10 to 12 hours every day. And exactly what you said happened to me during the last like three months of the year when I had to play to get my rake back and I couldn't take days off. My win rate just went down, 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 down. And I remember looking back on those last three months going, if I just didn't play those three months, it wouldn't have made much of a difference. And it was just like, it was so disheartening because I had other friends who were, were high win rate players playing a quarter of the hours I was over the course of the year and their graphs were like, great. And I went for this really super high volume at the stakes I was playing. And it was just a, it was not understand exactly what you talked about. Didn't understand recovery, didn't understand rest, didn't understand the mind isn't a machine and it needs to, uh, yeah, it requires fatigue. It needs to rest and recover. And yeah, I think for most players in a downswing, there's one or two things happen. Either they'll want to play through and get back their money quickly. So they'll almost like play bad volume, as you mentioned, not take recovery, or they'll just like want to just study all the time and not play at all. Just, I want to just learn more stuff, get more certainty about the game, and then I'll come back to it. But as you mentioned, somebody's just getting away from the game, taking a break. I think what you were talking about is two things. One, a strategic weekly break. So one day off a week works for you, for everyone listening, find your kind of uh, weekly sustainable kind of work to uh, break ratio, but find a sustainable kind of uh, routine. But then also like when things aren't going well, just take a step back, take a step back from the game and then come back with some studying and then back into playing. So yeah, I think it's really, really good advice. And I'm the same, I have the same motivation and enthusiasm for recovery, for performance. And I think once people understand it, and I, as you mentioned, feel it for themselves, you don't go back because once you realize I'm more curious, I perform at a higher level, I have less stress, I have more tolerance for emotions because I'm well rested. Ah, why would I not have that as part of a systemized approach to my days and lives? Hmm, maybe I should. So yeah, anyone listening, hopefully some, some people will go away from this and think about how they currently um, approach recovery and start, start to re, re, reevaluate. So for you, uh, when you are trying to rest, let's say um, on this 100 buying down in particular, what are some of the things that you did away from the tables? Anything you do in particular to uh, allow yourself to switch off? Because some players struggle with breaks because their minds always think about poker and they struggle to give them something downtime. So anything you do in particular? Yeah. Uh, once more, thanks a lot. You you do a really great job to um, uh, consolidate right uh, all of my thoughts. Uh, that was really great conclusion, and uh, thanks a lot for that. So, as for me, also I would like to mention that uh, one more advice uh, for downswing is uh, going back not only for the rest but going back. Uh, your limits as well if you uh, feel that you are stressed enough already that you are just like I don't want to play this fucking game like all of that uh, like really bad environment already uh, you just please please go down in, in stays uh, please don't feel like if you go down you are a loser and if you go down you lose some EV all of these things are really, really uh, bad and they they don't help you, they do the opposite. If you go down uh, in uh, stakes, uh, you can play only like a week, but you would build a lot of confidence back and this would help a lot to get this win rate, win rate back. And if your win rate is back to the uh, good amount, or to the uh, good number, you would uh, like uh, go from a downswing much more faster. Like if you have been rate in bad condition, you would uh, be in downswing much more peer much more time when your win rate is uh, good enough. Yeah, and um, uh, <laughs> sorry, what was your question? <laughs> no, very very important, and yeah, I, I like that you. Uh... Yeah, brought that as well because I think some players get too stubborn. You could spend a lot of time moving up stakes, and to move down seems like a um, almost like a step backwards. When in reality, yeah. as you mentioned, like confidence is so important. Like I always 
people don't underestimate how important it is to be confident in your game, confident in your strategy. And when you lose confidence, poker is like the hardest game in the world and everything feels against you. So yeah. you need to take a step back and like rebuild that confidence in, in a safe environment, like dropping down stakes almost like, oh, awesome. Like, as you mentioned, you want a downswing, a big one, you move down stakes and you're just playing fearless. You're just like, right, load everybody up, let's go. Because your confidence at that level was, is a good environment, a safe environment for you to re-explore strategy, get curious again. You weren't losing tons of money that you were used to losing at higher stakes. So it's like a playful environment to, uh, to regain confidence. Yeah, uh, I remember you, you asked about my uh, routine when I take a break, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, I have to mention sport um, because sport is also uh, a very big part of your po poker professional career, I think. And uh, now uh, I have an injury because I went to play soccer. And yeah, well, I'm too old for soccer. <laughs> Probably because uh, in um, my three last years, I had too much injuries uh, from that game. And now uh, I'm sitting here having no spot for two months because uh, what doctor said me and I feel much more different because I don't do any sports. And uh, um, at least I have to mention that my stamina, right? It goes down a lot. I can't when i'm in good enough uh, shape i can easily play like seven hour session and uh, it's easy for me and if i do any sports right now i'm like in four on fourth uh, hour of my session i'm like oh i'm fucking tired i want to go sleep and and i finish my session and i feel like i cannot do anything so um funny thing that uh, poker uh, sport doesn't uh, take your stamina but it takes it gives it back uh, for some reason i don't know how it works exactly i'm not a specialist but yeah please do some sport and um you can choose lots of sports right there you can you can go play tennis you can go play soccer basketball volleyball you can do the gym you can do lots of stuff you just have to pick uh, the one you like you can do swimming as well swimming this is actually kind of fun so uh, from my poker experience if you do sport it's much easier much better and also talking about down swings it's easier to get through them when you do some sport because when you are playing, uh, like let's say basketball, you you only care about throwing the ball into the basket, and that's the only thing. You you don't care about nothing at all, uh, but doing the goal, mm -hmm. and it's it's crazy good. So it's like a meditation, uh, and uh, I think now everybody already heard how uh, it's good for the brain to recover and do meditation all that stuff yoga uh, but yeah sport is like the best and easy meditation and now i feel lots of different uh, lots of difference and i wouldn't say that i'm like sports fun and uh, i'm like a so strong guy i do lots of sport it's not about me but uh, I do some sport all of my life um, and I feel a lot of difference when I do and then I don't. And when you play poker, a lot of time it takes too much energy and, um, and time from you. So you would say like, I can't go sport right now. It's not a good time. Um, it's too much poker for me right now. I'm just so stressed. I'm just so focused. I'm just... Uh, I cannot do sport right now, please later. But that's that's a big mistake, which I did a thousand times already. And now um, I see that difference uh, much more because I just became older. I just did um, a lot. I, I, I just had more experience now. I'm like, uh, I just turned 29 and it's been nine years in my poker career. And now I just see these uh, things more clearly. And I'm sure that in five or uh, three or five years, I would uh, feel like I'm stupid uh, at this moment. Uh, and it's just uh, the way life goes. But right now I, I see this 
uh, th that I was so mistaken when I prefer only to focus on poker and don't do anything else. And I have to mention that if you, for example, don't want to do any sport, you just hate sports. And there are some people who are like that. I, I'm sure I, I know some. Uh, please just uh, just go walk on the street. Uh, you can you can listen to the pod, for example, in your headphones. Just just go walk uh, somewhere or, or or do don't do the running if you don't want to run. Just just walk, please. And it would uh, help a lot in your poker um, appearance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you you play much much better when uh, you do something like that sport or walking. Yeah, but please just walk for for an hour, let's say. And when you go back, uh, I'm sure that you would crush. I I can even uh, I don't remember the word. So um, yeah. I can guarantee that you would crush. Yeah, just please do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and actually for me, um, that's a big, really big mistake of me during all of my poker career because before poker, I did much more sport and all of my poker career, I'm like, oh, no, no, not right now. I, I'm, I'm too focused on poker. I have to be really good at poker i have to put hours in it's not about sports right now please please later but that's a mistake yeah mm. yeah i think it's understanding yeah. that the body is built to move and that the brain as an organ requires the body to be healthy to some degree obviously we've got like nutrients going to the brain we've got our hearts pumping blood we've got our lungs taking the oxygen if you think about like energy as you mentioned like we think like of going to the gym or exercising as taking energy, but on the long term, we gain energy because the systems that generate energy get upgraded. So uh, I'm sure anyone can relate to this. They've done exercise for a period of time. They feel fitter. They feel healthier. They start playing poker. They can concentrate for longer. They can focus for longer because yeah, you've kind of fine tuned the systems that allow you to have more energy. So yeah, I think a kind of takeaway for a lot of players is find ways to be active in your days. And it's sometimes challenging. Like a lot, a lot of players will sit at their computers all day or they're in a casino all day. If they're live players and just trying to find time to be active. And like, you said it doesn't have to be boring stuff do the things you like but also just be active moving like a, a walk in the morning a walk in the evening doing things just to get the body moving and blood flow going it's just so so important for your mental health but also your long-term yeah physiology in terms of being able to play at a high level and i really think as you get older like i'm say older in a very loose terms here 30 to 50, you need to start thinking more about how to uh, keep the body active to keep the energy high. In your 20s, you kind of get away with it. You can just, you have high yeah. energy even when you, sure. you do nothing. And then you start to take for granted. And I speak to a lot of people who uh, start telling themselves stories in the 30s going, oh yeah, it's time to get the energy I used to have in my 20s. I'm like, yeah, because you don't exercise anymore. You used to exercise in your 20s or do stuff. So uh, yeah, it's just finding ways to, uh, yeah, keep ourselves moving, keep ourselves active and realizing even as a poker player, even if you don't care one bit about what your body looks like, it's going to help you long term to perform better, focus at a higher level and be happier going forward. So uh, with you, I've got one a bit of a paradox in my mind, which I want to clarify. So um, when you were first going to poker and you're moving up stakes, you mentioned that you weren't thinking about money and you are quite fearless and it's going next level, next level. But then you also mentioned at one point that scared of going broke and being passive is kind of built into your hardware and your nature a little bit. So uh, talk me through where they collided. So let's say you, you start out in poker and not really care about the money, but at some point I'm guessing there's a collision course with your, your nature being more risk averse. And how has is, how is that played out? Yeah, I think uh, that uh, this my sport betting uh, environment helped me a lot because when I was uh, going up, uh, these like, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 uh, bankroll. Uh, it didn't feel like a success yet. It, feel, it felt like uh, only just a step. And um, so it wasn't like a big amount of money for me, but when I reached like 100K, uh, that's when the fear, uh, fear uh, approached me. I, I remember Elliot Row, right? That's uh, uh, so he's like a mindset coach in poker environment, and um, I remember his uh, one of his video. I, I actually uh, watched lots of I actually lots tons of uh, poker stuff. So I basically watch everything. I know all of the players of all countries. So that's uh, what I'm talking when I um, 
say that I leave poker. So Elliot uh, once mentioned that 100K is like the most um, usual struggle for all of the poker play players. And uh, yeah, uh, I would definitely agree with that. That's that was my my also struggle. Uh, so when you first get 100K, you feel like it's already pretty good. And when you go to like 95 from 100, you feel like, oh my God, oh no, 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 it's so bad. I, I should play 100 and 100 uh, so I could uh, never lose uh, to like 90. So yeah, I think my nature is, uh, is pretty passive and uh, I, I get scared a lot of going broke. And it's just uh, because before 100K, the money wasn't so big that I would be scared to lose. But as it gets bigger, the, um, the more fear comes in. So yeah, th this is just a struggle you have to go with. And just like you said, you have to understand your, uh, your nature and uh, build uh, tolerance against it you you have to reflect a lot and uh, uh, as for me I, I do lots of um uh, i just um, made some voices uh to myself when i go walking where i explain like for example right now so we just uh, have been on a vacation with my family for seven days. So just like I mentioned, I do rest. And um, uh, now I'm I'm back uh, to play poker. Probably I would start uh, tomorrow. I'm not sure uh, because of some other stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I also want to say that uh, before starting playing poker uh, after rest, uh, I for sure should do some studies. So I already uh, did um, some uh, G two O wizard studies. Uh, I played with uh, uh, trainer, right? And uh, yeah, so I just um, uh, remembered all of the spots, and I feel prepared. I feel uh, that uh, I miss poker. I, I want to play, and uh, now I have to be prepared mentally. So. I made voice uh, to myself where, where I say like, and now you want to go play, but you have to be prepared that in the first week you play, you, you might lose uh, 100K and you have to take it um, as a professional. You, you have to know that it's possible. It's not like a, a tragedy. Uh, this is just part of uh, the game of your profession. And so all of my, my career, I do lots of voices like that to myself. I, I never even um, listened to them. Uh, I think I listened back to one or maybe two of them, but I do that a lot. And this is just kind of reflection for myself, um, which helps a lot because my, my nature uh, is... Uh, at the same time, is good for poker because I'm not a gambler like I would uh, go play too high of a limit or I would... Uh, I, I'm not a tilt, tilt person, for example. Uh, I'm pretty lucky not to get tilted. Like, uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, reach that uh, moment in my poker session that I would be like, I fucking hate this game. Uh, blah 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 so it's pretty easy for me it, let, let's say if I start the session and I lose like three binds in five minutes I would probably be like oh okay well not a good start right and uh, just laugh at it and it's luck that I'm like that probably it's also environment and box and all that stuff but at this at one time I'm pretty lucky to be uh, that good person mentally for poker but at the same time my nature is very bad for poker because I'm just so scared person. I mean, I just, um, I'm so uh, conservative person, right? That there's a world. Um, so I, I always want to be like in comfort, not, not danger, not to risk too much and stuff like that. But 
in poker profession is it's uh, i would say if you pick two person and one of them is just a crazy mad and the other is just so um like so cal calm and uh so strategic and stuff like that the, the, the first one is either go broke or go crazy good and the second one would be like a 200 and l uh free bb player for his whole life it's mm -hmm. it's uh it's very often like that yeah mm -hmm. and so me uh, from my nature is a 200 and l free bb player and uh, to get through that I, I have to do lots of work both mentally physically uh sport uh environment poker studying lots of that and i'm not saying that uh i'm such a good worker and uh uh, I'm not trying to say that, uh, look at me, I'm uh, that good. I'm just saying that you have to understand this nature. And uh, if your nature is that passive, you have to do lots of work in poker because <clears throat> your nature is not good for poker in <clears throat> strategic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. strategically, uh, I'm pretty bad nature. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Great advice. Yeah. Great advice. And I really like the uh, audios as well. I think that's very practical. And not even playing the back, as you mentioned, just doing it as it's almost like replacing journaling, like writing journaling, but it's getting your thoughts out. And I thought it was very powerful actually the way you explained that because it's a toolkit for dealing with risk and building more risk tolerance. Because what you were doing is you were coming to terms with the worst case scenario, right? And if you think about risk, what a lot of risk is worrying about the worst case scenario. So for example, if I say, um, let's flip a coin for $1,000. If you can manage dealing $1,000, doesn't feel like a lot of money to you. You're like, yeah, let's flip the coin, no problem. If I say, let's flip a coin for everything you own, now you're like, whoa, whoa, if I lose, the worst case scenario is pretty bad. I, I, I can't deal with that. So not being able to deal with the worst case scenario is a big part of risk. So um, what you were doing with those reflections and those audios were going, today, I could lose 10 buy-ins. I could lose 100K in the next week. That could happen. This is the logistics nature of this game. I'm okay with that. And as soon as the mind could go, well, that could happen. That's a spectrum of probability in reality. That, that's okay. I can deal with that if it does happen. I would not like it, but it can happen. All right, cool. That's good. I'm prepared for that. Let's go. And you're, you're building some armor. I class is armoring up. The, the, the Stoics, okay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Stoic philosophy, but they're very big on like using negative visualization as a kind of preparation tool to allow you to go into hard situations and go, things may not go the way you want them to. That's okay, but I'm ready to, to deal with it. So yeah, I really like anyone who's maybe struggling with risk as well could try those tools of preparing for the worst case scenario and being okay with it. Because once you're okay with the worst case scenario, life's easy life's an easy game because like what can what can happen that's worse than the worst yeah. case so yeah yeah and even more uh, uh when i have uh, a really really bad downswing and also lots of uh, bad things happen in my life there are just some periods uh, in uh, life and it's okay but in you are in the moment of that period you feel like oh, this is just so bad this is just so tough uh why it's always me and all of these thoughts and um, when I have this right now, um, I built this uh, thought which helped me a lot. And uh, it maybe sounds crazy, but I would like to share it. And it's like that. Uh, let's say you die right now and this ends. And there are no problems. But uh, are you okay to uh, choose that option? Or you just want to stay here and deal with that, all of that bad stuff? And the answer is completely always two. And I feel so relaxed after that. And uh, let's, yeah, it maybe sounds uh, very beautiful, but in that moment when you feel like you are cursed and everything's so bad, uh, it helps me a lot. And uh, yeah, poker is such a profession that you have uh, lots of downswings and it's normal. And if uh, also at the same time, there are now bad things, so you, you just might get in that period of bad everything a lot in your poker career. That, that's what I'm saying. And uh, this thing that uh, you, you can just uh, choose to die right now helps me a lot. And I, I'm not uh, talking that I want to die. I, I never want to die. But uh, this thing, this thought helps me a lot to rebuild that uh, I'm lucky to be here in that spot and I can deal with all of that stuff and 
it's it's soon it's be go- it, it it will be gone for sure it's mm. it always like that and uh, yeah mm. Yeah, so what you're doing there is changing perspective. So you're comparing what feels like a big problem of losing a poker, and you're comparing that to death. And all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, like, it ain't too bad. I think often yeah. a lot of our problems in life are we get too zoomed in, too zoomed in on the, the, the day-to-day, like you're, you're on a downswing, and you feel like you're, you've got the worst problems of all time, and your life sucks, and you're, why you? Well, you're the victim. But if you realize like, well, like big problems going on in the world, or dying, or things in your family that are going badly, and you start to take a second to just zoom out from your zoomed in lens and look at things around you and go, actually, life's not too bad. And often you'll, you'll as you mentioned, you'll start to uh, realize, actually, I enjoy poker. I'm actually quite lucky compared to even most jobs on the world yeah. to be a poker player and to sit at my desk, be my own boss and pursue my own goals, even that. So yeah, I think often when you do that perspective exercise, you come back to gratitude and be more grateful for your situation. Now, it doesn't mean it magically goes away and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this is amazing. I love downswings. But it does give you a, um, an angle to not overreact to things going against you, which I think is a really powerful tool. So yeah, I'm really liking how you're reflecting your stories, but also giving little lessons and little tools that other players can try as well. Because I, I do think life is a game of trying to uh, understand how to deal with adversity better, especially as a poker player, so you can, as you mentioned, protect your win rates and show up consistently to uh, to get your goals. So yeah, really, really good stuff that we're learning here. So um... I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Quick reminder, Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program is currently open for enrollment and we've put together the biggest promotion ever. 25% off on the program and three bonuses worth close to 3,000 euros of free value. Enrollment is open for the first couple of weeks of January before we close the program permanently. So don't miss out. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com. Sign up now and let me and Adam help you achieve your poker goals in 2024. Hey, Renny, I want to pass over to you now. In terms of your preparation and making sure that you protect your win rate and it doesn't drop, anything that's been become more important over the years for you to make sure you can do that? I mean, we touched actually on a lot of points that I completely agree with. Uh, I would say my, I I think I I wrote down in big letters, the bigger picture. That's, I think, what we've been talking about here. It's very easy in poker to really zoom in, like, oh, I want to improve my win rate and then people dive into a solver. But like, we have to zoom out way more. And basically, you're an athlete and you try to manage your life so you can perform at your best and you can gain win rate in many different areas. I really liked... Uh, what uh, what Nikolai said about the aligning his expectations, like, okay, you're going to start playing tomorrow and you can lose 100K and that's sort of okay, coming to terms with the best case scenario. I think it also helps then, let's say, for example, I would go into a session, I would be like, okay, it's possible that I will lose five buy-ins right now. So then when it actually happens, you don't freak out. Whereas if you like you go in, you expect to win and suddenly you lose five buy-ins, you're like, what the fuck is going on? And then you can kind of flip out. Whereas if you're like, yeah, well, this was a likely scenario. So you don't freak out and you manage to preserve your win rate for the rest of that session, right? That's, a, I think, a, a team that we've been talking about a lot. Like you build your win rate maybe by studying, but you actually turn that win rate into money by preserving that win rate, by managing yourself, by trying to show up in the best way. And there's various tricks that we can do that. I actually once heard the, the tip. I don't know where you record the voice, but I once got the tip, like you can create a WhatsApp group you add, for example, someone that you know and yourself, and then you have that person leave, and then you have a WhatsApp group chat just with yourself. So yeah. that really helps to to record audios. Exactly. I think that's really good. Yeah, I think that yeah. I think that's a very good very good thing. I used also just to write notes or ideas to myself. Yeah, it's pre- it's pretty interesting. Actually, I I I wrote down one one experience that I had when I was playing live in Vegas uh, last year. There was I think it was towards the end of my trip. I want some money. And I was like, okay, well, I felt like locking up the win, but no, I had two more days to play. So obviously, you know, it's a feeling that I can get like, ah, well, I'm up now. You know, we can also just call call it a call it a trip. But I was like, no, no, I'm gonna play. And I was playing, but I wasn't I wasn't feeling I wasn't feeling I was feeling a bit anxious. I don't know really know what was going on. And then there was a spot, I don't know, I felt like a little bit of fear of losing back or something like that. And there were and then there was a spot where I remember I had like a suited wheel ace. I open. I open from the uh, from the big blind. The straddle three bets. I four bet. So it was like one fifty, four hundred, one thousand or something. And then uh, I think the board came. I'm not mistaken. King high. I see bet. He calls. Turn brought double flush draw, and I had like ace low. So I thought, ah, oh, it's a good 
good hand to to triple barrel with. He has a lot of the flush draws. He's gonna call fold, but the yada yada on block folds, block calls. You you know the deal. So I so I felt I felt like some some resistance because I was in like a more risk averse state. But my logic took over. It's like this is like not combo, not not run out. So okay, let's go. So I I, I make the double barrel river bricks easy triple and he snap calls. Uh, river was a queen. He snap calls with queens and I lost. I lost my I lost my stack. Um, uh, and actually after that I felt like this sort of ease. It's like ah, the thing that I was quote quote afraid of or that I didn't want to happen happened, and I feel fine. So I just grabbed money from a back reload, yeah. and I was feeling great. So it was exactly what Adam said. Like you kind of like you're maybe afraid of something happening, and then it actually happens, and then you realize, listen, it was actually okay. So actually. That bluff being called was actually something that kind of relieved me you from. Can't afford it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very weird. You had to, you had to, you had to lose your stack in order to feel okay. But that was, that was, I guess, what I was. I wasn't feeling well. They really didn't know what it was, but it was kind of a bit like fear, I guess. And then when it happened, I actually felt felt pretty okay. So that was, that was in, uh, that was just a, a random hand that popped up when I heard you were talking about about that. You also, uh, we. We talked a little bit about downswings as well. I think Adam pointed out that there were two things. You either start playing more, which is actually very counterintuitive. It's normal, but it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to not play more because you want your money back. So you think, okay, I'm going to play to get my money back. But as you mentioned, if you play at a lower win rate, then playing more is actually maybe not the best idea, right? And then Adam, I think, also managed to study. And then I would want to add to that, guy... Because like you could feel uncertain in a downswing and studying can bring back that certainty. And I fell for the trap in the past that you would then just ignore the feeling of uncertainty whatsoever and you just try to rationalize that away. But I think it's very important to just feel the uncertainty and be okay with it. Like, oh, listen, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got beaten up. It's normal that I feel a bit uncertain or a bit low confidence. It's completely fine. And I will get my, myself back up. But not to use studying as a tool just to get rid of the uncertainty and not allow any uncertainty to be present. I think that's an involvement in my emotional management uh, system that I would like to, to share with the audience as well. You also mentioned, what, mentioned when you come back after a break, we talked a lot about the breaks and why it's so important. I think there's a lot of knowledge in your head that is just floating around and it needs kind of time to settle. And I think a yeah. break helps helps kind of settle. And then when you look at the same problem, like a poker hand, you suddenly get new ideas because you literally freed up your mind to actually come up with new ideas, right? You you gave your mind some time to place all the thoughts you had in your head in the right boxes to clean it up a bit. And now you can play and you can see things way more clearly. What I actually like to do when I, when I come back from a break or haven't played in a long time, I actually like to jump in straight ahead because often we're we want to prepare a bit better to kind of get rid of the kind of pre-session anxiety a bit, you know, to make sure that we, that, that, that we show up well, but I actually would recommend to just start in straight away and just see what comes out. And usually you actually be surprised. I think you also mentioned, we think yeah. that we forget more than what we actually forget. Yeah. But I, 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 I remember I had a session with Jared about this and then he said, yeah, Renee, you keep on talking about how bad your game is. If you wouldn't prepare, but have you ever played without preparing? And I was like, huh, ah, good point. No, I did not. So what I would then do is if I would come back, there's actually a great opportunity to just sit down, play, and see what comes out. You will see what your C game looks like. And again, that aligning expectations here is very important. You're not going to play your A game, okay? Most likely you're going to be a bit rusty. But hey, just see what comes out. So again, aligning expectations there, uh, I think are going to be very important. So yeah, you guys... You guys just touched on so much great topics about like managing your career from a bigger picture. And it's actually something that I personally enjoy and sort of miss because I don't play, I'm not as serious about poker and playing poker at the moment. But when I was fully on just everyday poker, play, poker, play, poker, actually what I really miss about that is the fact that you're an athlete and you can try to manage yourself so you have to do exercise and you every time try to be in a peak state of performance that whole routine around it that's something that i would say i miss the most of yeah really really taking poker series and playing every day and trying to get yeah. the best out of your out of your career is that something that you enjoy as well because people can feel like oh, i have to exercise oh i have to do this no but you have to 
it's it's actually a lot of fun to try to optimize. Yeah, sure, sure. It feels great. Yeah, you you actually summarized really really good all of the things we mentioned. I think, and uh, yeah, uh, poker bean is an athlete. This is so good explanation uh, as for my at my in my opinion, because yeah, building your win rate and uh, maintaining your win rate is uh, much more than just uh, playing with uh, G2 or Wizard and uh, like selecting the best games. It's much more than that. It's lots of lots of small details behind that. And I, I would say like that, you can for sure achieve like three, four BBs uh, doing just uh, good, uh, ju just playing and just doing some studying. Uh, if we talk about some okay limits like 1k at least uh, 500 1k but if you want to go for 7 plus you have to do lots of other stuff just not just uh, practicing and studying poker lots of other stuff behind behind like top result win rates yeah so and uh, going for that top result win rate is a pretty good adventure yeah because uh, yeah it's an enjoyable process reflect. i would say or at yeah, least the way yeah. i'm wired i guess i guess i enjoy it no i i would say the same and all of this reflection which i do uh, when i make these audio voices uh, uh it feels so happy actually and um, when i just talk to myself um uh, it feels so it builds lots of confidence and it's just uh, you feel life different when uh, you go through all of that stuff when you like there is uh, something you you're afraid of and you just go deep in that mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's interesting and it's enjoyable when uh, you do uh, that regularly because when you just uh, became like fearless and uh, it helps a lot not only in poker but in the whole life so now uh, for some reason i feel uh, much more confident in my life I, I always was like afraid that poker would end in two years and there's all actually a meme in uh, poker community that uh, poker is uh, ends in two years and we, we have to uh, earn some money really fast because uh, yeah uh, it's gonna get closed in two years and I was really afraid of that and that's basically the main reason why I didn't have any breaks but now I feel much more different because poker taught me a lot and I'm grateful for that it's not only playing poker and earning money it's also like um i i had to reflect a lot to achieve uh, my goals in poker and it helped me to build uh, understanding and uh, confidence in like whole life and now i'm not scared that i would go broke if i go broke i think i'll manage actually and uh, even though now uh, my family is used to spend lots of money, we are uh, we are having pretty good uh, level of life, and uh, I need lots of money to to feel okay. Uh, but I don't feel like it's uh, crazy bad, and uh, I feel like uh, I would just take it um, like as professional as um, I uh, try to take all of my downswings in poker. Like, yeah, and the I think also just... the, scar the scarcity around it is gone and you've built it enough confidence in yourself to be able to figure it out. Even if worst case scenario, worst case scenario happens, you've built so much more skills than just playing poker that you'll yeah. find a way. I, I had to build uh, those skills. That that's a good thing about poker. So just like I said, you can go three BB and uh, it's much easier. But if you want to go for like seven, and I always wanted to be a top uh, regular on my state, 
it was like uh, the thing that um, helped me a lot uh, because um, I never wanted to go a high stakes, just like I said, on the three, uh, last three years, I, I changed my priorities. But back uh, then, um, the main goal of myself was like be the cost of my limit, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, I would just uh, sit the table and like I can play everybody. I, I don't care. You, you can play. And actually, the funny thing about that is that um, when you are hosting your limit um you are not scared of anyone let's say uh before my high stakes uh journey uh i was like playing one two k and um yeah i I, um, I played a lot of volume already there i had lots of down swings up swings i had lots of experience there and i'm not afraid to play anyone at those stakes Let's say uh, I'm running, uh, I'm like uh, on the 2K table and uh, like Limbs pops up and uh, Stefan and then one, they want to play free marks with me. I'm okay with that. It's, that's a great experience that poker is not about money only. And I know that uh, I might uh, be losing to that, but actually it's not that easy because right now they can be in not their best shape they they can have some games uh, at the side they uh, they can like let's say uh, linus can be just practicing heads up too much recently and he's not that good and three marks and lots of lots of stuff and uh, for example uh, he might just be finishing the session he had like 20 uh, year uh, 20 uh, hour session at uh, high stakes and he's just tilted so it's not that easy, like Linus is better player than me and he would destroy me. So I'm not scared to play if this is my limit. Uh, and if uh, this game would start, I would play it and I would enjoy it. And I would enjoy even losing it because uh, poker is so much more than just uh, going there for money. It's um, a lot of other stuff and I enjoy it a lot. And that's why I love poker and um yeah so it's also it's also interesting like when when you take a shot at like two of these guys for example let's say for example you're a bit lower in the rank and like i said they could have already been playing or they have other tables that have their priorities and they kind of put like their b or c game and you actually show up to this game it's like wow this is like it's like yeah. an exciting game you know so actually you'll be playing more of your a game so i think this actually will level out i remember actually when i would battle a lot I had one criteria, which I thought was really good. I would only battle if I would be the one starting the battle. So uh, the way it used to work, I don't know how, I think in GG is the same, right? Two people sit, but the use, it used to be like then it starts, two people sit, and then one can join, and then usually the three-handed game starts. What I would then do is, let's say, for example, I was sitting. Most of the time, if someone would join, I would leave the table. Okay, I would take 10 minutes, 10, like 10 minutes or so, like, okay, who joined the player? What kind of player is he? What's my game plan? And then I would join on my terms. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, That's... like, I would always have that yeah. edge. I would oh. be the one starting the game. So I would have the edge to pick the seat. I would be the one to decide now it's the time. I would ha I would take that 10 minutes just to go over my notes, like, okay, who's this guy? Ah, oh, yeah, this, this guy, okay, yeah. this is a guy, this is Rob Proxy. So I would always join the join the game on my terms, and I think that gives you a huge edge, just like as you said, because I I came in more prepared than the other person. It's a really good, good uh, attitude in uh, raid battles, I think. Um, yeah, th this 10 minutes can huh. help. But by the way, this, this doesn't work if everyone does it, right? Because then everyone yeah. keeps on just leaving <laughs> it. Like, okay, that guys, let's just agree to all come back 15 <laughs> minutes later, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it actually, like, there is some mind games between that as well. Because, like, um, when, when you just leave the table, it feels like you feel that he's stronger. But then... If you are back, then it feels like you just left because of some other reasons. And yeah, I'm ready to battle. Let's go. And uh, for him, uh, for your opponent, it, it might look um, much more uh, difficult than if he just set, uh, set in in the... You, yes. You try. You, yeah. So when, it, when he good... joined, he was like, okay, I want to battle. And then when you mm -hmm. when you leave him to calm down a little bit, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then you come in with that <laughs> attitude, down, you have an immediate attachment. So uh, mm -hmm. 
a little trick here and how everyone in the high stakes community is going to sit out, sit in, sit out, sit in. So we talked actually a lot about maintaining win rate, but let's talk a little bit about building win rate. I'm, I remember you you just recalled again that for the last three years, you know, you've been building your game so you can beat the high stakes. Before that, you were mainly playing mid stakes. You talked the main thing that that changed, right? You eliminated distractions of your crypto, your other investments in business, and you went to live poker. How does that look like for Nikolai? Nikolai is living poker. What's like a day in a day in the life of Nikolai? You know, trying yeah, to so trying to reach those highest stakes, living those, poker. I have pretty um, uh, stable routine, right? Stable is is that a word or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So stable routine. So uh, now uh, I'm living in uh, Phuket, and um, uh, I wake up at uh, seven a.m. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I tried uh, different. I, I tried to play night. I tried to play uh, day. Uh, and uh, every time um, I realized that uh, for me personally, it's better to uh, start playing uh, in the morning. Uh, and I, I think it's also an um, important thing that you have to choose for yourself exactly because people are really different in lots of ways and you have to to know uh, your your best uh, to, to choose your best yeah so for me it's the morning so even uh, when I was in Russia my morning games were pretty bad but uh, all of my life um, is much better when I play morning the morning so uh, right now in Phuket is uh, cool to play in the morning because it's uh, like uh, nighttime in uh, uh, USA and uh, uh, so the games are pretty good, uh, especially at uh, WPM um, and Chico. Uh, I played lots of Chico back then when I played uh, 1K a lot. So um, 7 a.m. Uh, then I do my warm up. I always do the warm up. I had uh, lots of sessions with a uh, girl who is like uh, with back. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the word uh, how to explain what she does. It's just uh, basically um, building the best warm up for your profession, something like that. Yes, she just uh, was. Uh, she uh, she came back from gymnastics. She did um, uh, medical graduation, and uh, mm -hmm. she knows all of the muscles uh, stuff behind it. So uh, I have a pretty good warm up for uh, for my profession. So I would just sit, and I have like the table which can uh, go up and down, which is a common thing in poker. So I warm up and uh, I start playing poker. I I don't do like uh, one hour study before that, uh, all of that. No, uh, I just warm up my uh, physical uh, to, to get uh, like the blood. Uh, uh, yeah, because you're talking going. about straight after you wake up, you go to your office, yeah. you you get yeah. yourself a bit moving physically with this 10 minute exercise that, that you mentioned, and then you go straight into playing. There's no... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every time like that. And uh, usually my breakfast, uh, my wife uh, would... Uh, uh, get it right here for me and uh yeah i would play um just like you mentioned you said that you think that after resting it's better to just go play i think that after waking up uh it's better to just go play uh right after and not do too much preparations you just have to take uh, your games responsible enough so i wouldn't like uh, just uh, open all the tables and uh, wreck a war uh, all of them straight away um i would just uh, open all of the tables i i see uh, what games are um and I would start like pretty slow, pretty slow. And let's say in 30 minutes, I'm prepared enough and I can play uh, like everything pretty much. So uh, I play for, I play one session for six to eight hours, uh, I think. So it's, it's five days a week. Not that much actually, but um, that's my routine right now. Then I have one day 
which is like um, studying day. I don't do that much study. I think actually studying too much is also a mistake um, because poker is more of, or about uh, practicing and it's actually more about just uh, being able to catch that game, which uh, gives you lots of EV. I mean, uh, a lot of time I feel that mistake that a player uh, want to play a game only and he would just uh, leave after after a mistake to to go to wizard and uh, uh, study that mistake and then uh, when he studies uh, there is a, a vip player who just uh, you know uh, just yeah, all who the donates money. all the money yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, a, 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 a big part of a successful poker career is being there when the vip shows up right sure yeah so you have to spend hours in the lobby that, that's uh that's a very important thing i think so uh i don't advise uh i wouldn't have advice to study too much please play a lot and especially if you have a good enough win rate uh actually i, I uh, did lots of coaching back uh, then in my career as well when i was pretty uh, good crusher at 501k and uh, i was like investing all of that stuff i don't want to go for high stakes so uh, to uh, earn some more money i also did coaching and uh, i always uh, say that one you should move up uh, move up in stakes and b please if your win rate is good enough just play a lot when uh, you have to go study, uh, poker will tell you. Uh, don't worry, poker will tell you when you have to go study. If you have, if let's say you are just uh, mm, no NL one hundred grinder and you have five BB, you are very good mate. You just go practice. Don't care about studying. You don't need to study. You just go play. When you want to go short taken 200, you would probably get crushed because that's how poker works. And uh, then you can go study. But now just please play and build the bankroll because uh, that's how poker works. The main EV we get is just from VIP players. It's not about uh, finding some secret special uh, moment in uh, GTO Wizard or like Canton Notes and all of that stuff. It's not about that. It's just being there when the VIP player comes and when he just throws away all the table, all the money on the table. And um, yeah, there are lots of uh, really good <laughs> VIP players uh, uh, at online poker. And if you just spend a lot hours in the lobbies and if you would um, wreck battle. So uh, I think wreck button is a very important thing in poker career if you want to go uh, for top results because one you would um, be prepared to play against the toughest opponents where they would um, they would always put you in a tough spot so you would uh, have motivation to study and you would um, you would see uh, where your leaks are where your problems are and second which is probably even more important, you would always be on the table when the IP comes. And this mm -hmm. is very important because even let's say you are a really bad person and you have uh, like the best script ever, a sitting script, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, right now they are forbidden on all of the sites from as far as I know, but there are some people which still using it. And let's say your script is like uh, very, very, very fast. But for sure, it won't uh, seat you on the 100% tables. It's just impossible because there are tables, there are five guys battling. And when the AP comes at that table, you won't get the seat. And probably this the AP would lose like 15 buy-ins on that table. And you know what? That's how win rate is built in poker. So, um, Back to my routine, I don't do too much studying, but uh, five days I only play. One day uh, is for the studying. If I feel like studying, I would study all of that day. But when you, say, when, like... when you say study, do you mean like evaluate your week and evaluate how, how, how the week went in terms of you studying those hands or are you studying like... No, specific... no, I don't do that. 
I don't do that. And uh, I also would recommend to build your strategy. That's the main thing you should study on. Is just like be prepared to play every spot possible. And uh, for these three years, I did all of that. And now I can say that I pretty much know uh, how can I play every possible six max spot. Uh, not not perfect for sure, but the main idea behind that, how and why, uh, I know the answers, and that's uh, that's my hours which I put in. Uh, that's just uh, building that uh, knowing about all of the mm -hmm. spots. And, so that was that, uh, that, that, those were like the hours you put it in, preparing sort of to make the jump towards high stakes. I think I think you mentioned to yeah. me before that you know you spend it like. 10 to 20 hours on every spot just to prepare like kind of your default strategy in all spots. So you kind of yeah, from there yeah. know what to do. And from there, you know, I have a good default strategy. And from there, I'll take in new information that's presented to me at the table and I'll start to adjust uh, yeah, based on that information. Is, is that about yeah, right? And this default, yeah, absolutely right. And this default strategy is not about just uh, learning the GTO. It's about also learning the best uh, play against uh, population tendencies mm -hmm. this is this is my default strategy so uh i i should not only like play with trainer but also s study the population tendencies yeah so, so 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 for example to get an idea of you you sat down you said okay i'm gonna reach high stakes i'm gonna have to study every spot build my baseline strategy which is probably the first thing you probably look at is solver right gto frequencies how does it play kind yeah, of yeah. in the laws within within gto then you mentioned like data, or we're talking like hand to note NDA type of statistic, compare that to GTO to see where they deviate and come up with more optimal exploitive strategies. Is that kind of yeah, what yeah. we're talking about? Yeah, 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 sure. And also observing lots of the games. I, I always observe like all of the rag battles uh, possible. I always observe all of the uh, like really big, interesting games. So if I feel like this game is interesting, I would always watch it. Or, pr or probably I also did lots of, uh, back then I did lots of like just uh, um, starting to um, screen, uh, capture the screen so I can watch after. Yeah, yeah I've, I I've done this as well. I've done this as well quite yeah. a lot in the past. Yeah, and, and I think um, this is also helps a lot. So it builds like... Um, this understanding of people tendencies without uh, really like studying it in uh, hand to note and all that stuff because uh, studying poker is actually really boring and difficult from, from my point of view this is mm -hmm. very boring so I try to uh, switch between uh, between uh, like my studying options uh, so if I feel like uh, I don't want to go solo right now I, I can just watch game I can just, uh, you know, also I did lots of uh, uh, just uh, database uh, st studies uh, uh, on hand to note. I also uh, watched lots of games on YouTube, rec battles, and just mm -hmm. uh, tons of poker um, videos and uh, and histories and uh, also two plus two Fred. I, I don't even have an account on two plus two, but this Fred. Which is like high stakes poker. Yeah, yeah. So I read that a lot as well. And uh, yeah, I think um, if you talk about studying, studying poker, the the main struggle here is to do it consistently. And consistency is the key, I think. And um, so I try to build my consistency right here. Um, and there are lots of lots of pieces which helps me to be consistent in that. For example, I found um, uh, I had good advice to study poker, not at the same uh, room which you play in. So you can just take your laptop with your solar and go like to the cafeteria, have some coffee and uh, or tea, or you can go to the park, you, you can go like everywhere because it's pretty easy, especially with GTO Wizard. Um, to study poker or you can just uh, not do it with solar you can watch youtube video you, you can do lots of stuff but mm. when you do it in the same room it uh, can get uh, boring really easy and if you uh, switch sometimes 
if you uh, switch uh, the way you study, if you switch the place you study, if you uh, switch the person you study with, if you do that, it's it becomes not that boring. I also talked lots of poker uh, with uh, different people, and it also helped. So it's it's kind of yeah, a mind hack my... actually that 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 you're explaining here in terms of switching rooms. I've heard about this before, and I think this is very valuable to the. the to start at the base layer, you should have a different room where you play than where you relax. Because if you, for example, put your office in your bedroom, your brain actually gets quite confused. Like, wait, I'm in my bedroom. Am I here to relax and sleep or am I here <laughs> to fucking perform? And it's, I'm serious. Yeah. I, the, like the brain gets really confused. That's why for the vast majority of my career, I had a separate office, which was not even in my home. So I actually had to go to the office and going to the office, the act of itself, and then stepping into your office, your brain is like office, perform. And it's yeah. it, it does miracles, you know. And I remember I would drive my bike because we're in the Netherlands, you know. And I would always listen to uh, back then. I think it was Conor McGregor who was very popular, and I would listen to all these Conor yeah. McGregor motivational videos on my YouTube, driving towards my office, getting all fired up to start to play. And then you arrive in the office and like office perform. And then when you come home, you know you manage to relax better because you're home and your home is to relax. And I know you have you have a family as well. It allows you to also be to let go of poker and to be more present with your family. So I think separating rooms and then uh, exactly what you explained. I did exactly the same. I would grab my laptop, go to the cafeteria. That's where I would do my analyzing how I played. That's where I would yeah. do my my study work. So I, I I strongly I think I think you're giving. I mean that's a, it's a bit it's, it's a bit narcissistic. I was there. I think you're giving good advice because I agree. But you you you, you get what I mean. Uh, um, we yeah, we talked actually also, also a lot about sorry. Yeah, sure. I think that probably uh, uh, this thing that you have uh, uh, motivation videos, uh, Conor McGregor, and you're driving uh, on a bike to the office, this probably would give you like uh, half uh, BB win rate. For sure, plus, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, for sure, and again, it's like it's it like the might... bigger picture, you know? Yeah, yeah. In, in bigger picture, it, it's crazy how it uh, works because uh, poker especially poker at the top level is just so mo uh, lots of small details like really small details but lots of them even like remembering specific hand which you played like uh, against some uh, opponent would can can help you a lot against same opponent in uh, this hand and mm -hmm. so all of that small piece and if if you study like your database your hands and you remember this hand it can help you in one specific hand like a lot and uh, all of that small pieces uh, build your win rate so yeah, i think also showdown showdown related studying like you mentioned see like uh, seeing seeing hands being played by other players like you can obviously study the numbers and see like, okay, this note is overfolded or under bluffed and compared it to the GTO frequency. That's one way it stimulates your brain in a certain way. You get more yeah, cognitive knowledge, but seeing showdowns and seeing people actually play the hand and seeing the hand turn out, that kind of trains more, I would say, your intuition. And it's kind yeah, of yeah. one showdown can indeed like be grained in your head. Like, oh, wait, this showdown really is grained in my head, especially if it's like outside of the norm. And that can really help you make a better decision uh yeah later in a hand that you play against that opponent that, that's such a beautiful uh thing in poker uh, when, when you explain on that I, I see the beauty of this game and mm. uh, for me it's uh, it's like crazy Actually, cool be before before i want to ask uh, a question that i know a lot of players are struggling with i wanted to add one more thing about the the managing of your session that i, I wrote down this note but i didn't get to it and you manage as well, right? You play for eight hours. And it's not like in the in the beginning, you just jump into a game like, oh, you know, you wake up. Uh, oh, Linus is sitting. Linus, Stefan, 300. Oh, let me sit down. Let's go. <laughs> you know, that's not really the way it works. Like also, especially if you sit down and let's say, you know, you're going to play 10 hours today. Okay. Energy management, for example. Yeah. It's also management. very important. Like people, people jump great. into a game, short pictured with the only question they have is, Am I plus EV in this game? That's the criteria that they need to join the game. And I say, yes. Yeah. Okay, so you sit down and play. Oh, I'm a plus EV in this game as well. Yes, 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 yes. And then before you know it, you plan to play 10 hours of good volume. Well, if you're going to play 10 hours, you probably should not join every day, but that's presented to you. That's plus EV, right? We should think, mm, no, I'm going to play 10 hours. So is this table worth it? Or should I now waste a lot of my energy wreck battling? Or I'm already eight hours into my session. 
Should I still yeah. join Linus and Stefan three-handed? Probably not Energy a great idea. So maybe I should yeah, I should wreck battle a bit more in the beginning, wreck battle less at the end of my session, and be a bit more selective with the games. Also, like you could even take this to another level. Like what I would then sometimes do is have I'm going towards the end of my session. Let's say I've played for six, seven, eight hours. And there's like a lot of marginal hands that I could play, like in solver 0.01%. I would just be like, listen, I'm here because this fucking will is still here. You know, that's the only reason I'm still saying I'm not going to open like this bottom hand right now and get into all types of spots because I don't have the brain power for it. I'm already six hours into my session. I'm not able to make great decisions. So maybe pass up on like these very marginal, marginal preflop opens in certain spots or marginal three bets yeah. against opponents that, you know, maybe just got fresh into their session. These are all things to take in consideration, right? We're not robots. That's, I think, also something that, that you mentioned, right? We're not, we're, we're not the machines. Yeah. The, 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 when you uh, explain all of that, I, just like I said, I see the beauty of this game because it's a lot of these small pieces and this energy management, like you mentioned, that's a really, really big part of your win rate as well. And uh, this um, difference between 3BB player and like 8BB player, uh, a lot on all of that uh, things, like like you mentioned, uh, energy management and like Ray Butlin also. Um, in the end of the session, uh, for example, I think you, you shouldn't really wreck battle. Uh, I always uh, stop all of my wreck battles in the end of the session, especially if I have good enough games. And actually, when the games are really good and I have uh, time to uh, to extend my session, I would just uh, I would just uh, close all of the tables, which are like uh, small plus CV. I would just play like three tables with huge plus, plus, plus EV, but I would focus a lot more on that. And if I feel tired enough, I can even like, uh, you know, listen to the music or uh, watch some YouTube on the side. And it feel, um, it's not like professional enough, but still it's a lot of plus EV and it's much better if I just play like eight tables with some reg button on the side and stuff like that, because I would just miss a lot of um, important hands. And th this way I can just, okay, th th this hand I would play. So I just stop my YouTube and I would just focus on that hand. I would just, you know, see all of the showdowns previously. I would just open my replayer and I'm focused. I, I have enough money and uh, enough time, sorry, and enough uh, energy to focus and enough like um, stamina, I, I can yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, like uh, when you sit, uh, when you start the session, let's say you have like 100 points of uh, focusing energy and all of that. And towards the end of the session, you, you have like seven left, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you can just spend all of the seven to some uh, unimportant stuff, like you mentioned, like opening the hands, uh, uh, for betting, uh, like uh, margin of hands, uh, like def uh, defending, like for bet against really tough player uh, with... Uh, let's say um, ace five suited. Uh, so you you don't have to do that. You can just skip that spot and it would be fine. But uh, if you try to uh, play this spot, especially against really tough opponent, the thing is uh, the toughest opponent is uh, the more energy you can spend uh, to play against yeah. him. Especially if you are like a butler in your heart. And yeah, and, 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 and just... if... if... If you would play all these spots, and that would mean you have to quit 30 minutes earlier, for example, it's better to not play these spots mm -hmm. and play 30 more minutes with the wheel at the table. Yeah, yeah. And that's and way also, more plus EV. Like, uh, if we talk not about 10 hour session uh, and uh, like four hour session, you can just uh, get tired too much, uh, playing too much, and you would just quit because you are tired already. But uh, at like, 20, in, 20, in 20 minutes you left, the huge uh, VIP player might come. So just like I mentioned, it, so it's really important to uh, spend your hours in the lobbies and uh, to manage all of your energy and all of the time uh, correctly. And yeah. it's also a very big part of a poker professional. So poker yeah, professional too much players, is a lot too, of too. parts. Too much players just sit down. I'm gonna play three hours. They just fire up all the tables. 
and they might game select a bit more, but they don't take in consideration like, okay, I'm firing up like now these type of break even tables. I'm playing here with like a semi VIP, you know, like, is it really worth your time or should you maybe just close that table? Or if you have no tables, Hey man, just, just breathe a little bit for five minutes. I don't know. Do yeah. a stretch until you have a better table. That's actually something that you were hating on the bang, bang on the seating scripts here. But remember in the past when seating scripts were still allowed, I really loved that man, because I, you could just, you could do some stretching and you, you wouldn't mm -hmm. miss a game because you suddenly heard beep, beep, and that means it set you on the table. That was amazing, yeah, man. Yeah. You could, you could really take, you could take like a small break, close your eyes and you wouldn't miss a game. That was uh, that was amazing times. I, I wanted to touch uh, on one topic that I've noticed a lot of players struggle with when you mentioned that you spent like 10, 20 hours going over every spot to kind of prepare for the higher stakes game. So you had a good default game plan in every situation. What's the level of detail you go into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it depends on the spot. They're, they're more uh, frequent spot is the the deeper i would go so let, let's say like uh, squeezing uh, against mp uh, it, it's not uh, really important to study that much you just uh, basically want to know which sizes are uh, are used and uh, uh, how frequent are you borrowing stuff like that which hands you pick up how uh, important blockers are on the river do you have to block something or can you just uh, uh, go with the bottom of your range stuff like that and and you're done and uh, you you shouldn't really go back to that like in three years i think uh, and if we talk about like uh, button this is uh, bb spot uh, you can you should spend a lot of time there and actually i think like building uh, if we talk only about strategic um point uh, if we talk only about strategic part of uh, your win rate uh lots of your win rate comes from how you play as aggressor uh it's very important to play a scholar uh, really uh, good at a big blind, but as scholar you you have to suck a lot. It, it's just the way how poker works. So uh, it's uh, you, you just uh, have uh, to be kind of aggressive and use like some sizes, some donks, and but as aggressor there are a lot of um, a lot of opportunities and a lot of um, space uh to uh, to a lot of space to, to be creative and uh, lots of stuff you can do i mean like only let's say like you can uh, just uh, build your strategy that uh if uh, it went uh, check check on the flop you you can just uh, uh, start to implement free uh, x or, or over bad delay on the turn and against like population in lots of spot spots it can be really good strategy but it would just be uh, i mean like there are lots of space to build an edge in those spots because it always like if your opponent is not um de defend it enough in that particular situation in that range you can just be crazy and that what uh, solver teach uh, teaches us uh that you you can and not be crazy just like bluffing all the shit it's also about just uh, going like really thin and really uh expensive and you have to study a lot to to understand um how um because small uh parts of opponents uh, your opponent's range can um uh, differ your strategy a lot so mm -hmm. let's say just uh, in um uh, this is a spot uh, your uh, gto bot would uh, check raise like 20 percent and people tend to check raise five percent then if you lock the strategy th this is just crazy what solar does in those spots so yeah, um, from strategic point of view, um, putting lots of hours as uh, aggressor uh, in those just uh, SRP spots, uh, these are really important. And also free bad spots as well, like just to crazy in all of the free bad spots is also a very, very important thing. You, you have to put lots of hours in that because uh, lots of people are just tend to uh, 
100% CBAT, like every possible board. And this is still a thing, actually. And uh, and lots of boards, uh, your um, reaction is supposed to be like crazy, like 40. And this is so crazy. And you have to be prepared for that. You have to, uh, like, working in a uh, solver is just like uh, getting prepared for all of the um, ways which your opponent can go. And uh, if you're prepared enough to exploit all of the tendencies, you just have uh, to um, to understand the tendencies on uh, your opponent, on even on your population you're playing against, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just use all of these uh, preparations you, you did uh, back with solver. So... Yeah, you learn. Yeah. I, I, I think a very important thing. I, I agree with you. I think aggressor spots is these are spots where you can have direct the action, right? Like you managed, you talked about creativity. You can steer the hand into many directions where the defender is usually kind of having to respond yeah. to the strategy that the aggressor chooses. And That's what I like about really and what I think is effective as well when you choose to focus more on aggressor spots, when you when you focus on aggressor spots, you kind of learn what's correct. And then by learning what's correct, you'll also understand, okay, people are probably going to screw up. So as a defender, if you understand how hard it is to play a spot correctly, you will be able to defend yourself and exploit that note in a better way. So that's why, therefore, I also think aggressor spots are uh, are very important. And in terms of yeah. like level, level of detail, for example, I see sometimes students, they uh, they go over different textures. Are you more of like, no, I use one side. Let's just simplify one third on all boards, or do you add a lot of nuance to textures? Yeah, or how would you that's... recommend? Or how would you recommend studying this? That's actually the very good question because um, when I first uh, have my coaches with uh, good um, players, uh, they always uh, tend to say like, you should simplify your strategy as as much as you can. You should just go one size every street you shouldn't do any dunks and stuff like that and those are people who mm, beat in like 1k 2k uh or even high stakes so it's not like uh nl50 guys right mm -hmm. uh and i tend to simplify because of uh, them a lot but then uh, when i reached uh, 1k 2k and i was just uh, playing it consistently not going for the high stakes because they are dead just like i mentioned i find myself that uh, it's very boring for me to play poker and uh, even when i wreck battle like tough opponents it's really boring because i'm just basically know what i would do and this is just so easy and this is just so it, it becomes not more of a poker, but just like uh, printing the money, blah, 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 so boring. And th that's, it's not an advice, but if you are, um, if you have good win rate, but you feel like you already bought, please go uh, for the, for the more complicated strategy. You, you can, you can start, uh, throwing some donkey donkey <laughs> yeah donkey donkey uh, everyone yeah. likes a donkey donkey, yeah, donkey, donkey. Uh, i i love those uh, in your videos uh all of these donkey donkeys this is great so you can just start complicating your strategy not only because there is like huge edge between that yeah like everybody said there is no much edge if you go one size or two sides but actually it's not completely true because it's not big edge against solver but against your opponent it might be like a huge edge actually mm -hmm. so it's not that easy as well uh here is the beauty of poker but only for not to get too bored in your poker routine is it's already worth it i think so now uh, i i tend to uh, study some like rare spots to uh, and uh, add some sizings uh, like overbetting flops, like donking turns, like um, just straight uh, jamming with the flops or uh, in four bet parts, just using like uh, two street game in three bet parts. All of that stuff I just study, and it's not because I think uh, this would gain me an edge. It's just because I would like to see uh, the beauty of the game uh, to extend my knowledge uh to to be prepared for different spots and if i feel like oh this is very good i would implement that in my strategy but i don't have to i can just study it to get the bigger picture and it helps a lot 
uh, and uh, I see that um, doing that helps actually in different ways. Um, I find myself a lot in spots I don't study that I uh, took them more creative, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you you you, start... you understand you understand like cause effect relationship when certain variables line up in certain ways. This is usually yeah. going to be the consequence. So you're able to. This is actually something that the way I like to teach as well. You kind of zoom out more, focus on the impact certain variables have on strategies, kind of the mechanics behind the game, and that allows you to problem solve better in game. So that even if you're in a situation that you've never been in before, well, you kind of know like what what drives strategies, right? So you're able to problem solve and be more creative naturally not force you're not trying to memorize a complex strategy you know but it comes more intuitively because you understand the drivers behind strategy yeah yeah sure and uh, um at, at least it's uh, more fun to play like that to yeah it, to it, 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 you 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 think you think if you only play yeah, simplified yeah. strategies all the time you stop thinking yeah that that's uh, a point i'm trying to say that simplifying strategies is bad only because it's not bad for your win rate it's actually great for your win rate especially if you want to uh, be just a pretty good a pretty good rep but not the top rep but it's very dangerous because you can just stop thinking and if you do all of this complicated stuff you you can just uh, uh, switch to the thinking mode in all of the game, all of the hands you play, even in those like which are so common when you just uh, snap a uh, bad 33% uh, pot because you're used to, you can just like, oh, what if I go like half pot here? Uh, how is he supposed to react? And uh, here comes Stefan as well, again, uh, because what I really like about Stefan is just he not only feel is on the tables, he is also like really free to uh, play uh, every every crazy idea he gets. Uh, because like he, uh, we uh, had a spot on 5K uh, maybe like two months ago, which is pretty interesting. I, I think I opened the uh, cutoff, he defended uh, button, uh, blinds folded, and uh, board came like eight, six, four or something, I checked. And he went for the 75% on that flop. And all of the uh, solo guys would uh, screen shots uh, this immediately and say, like, you're supposed to go one, uh, 25%, 20%, 33%. You, you're supposed to go a lot and very small. But he just go 70 Stefan, he, he can even overbend this flop. And what is he trying to do is like, hey, I know how to do that. I know what I uh, supposed to go 25, but I would like to go 75. And what are you going to do with that? Do you yeah, know what, are you gonna what do you about should it? do? How, yeah, how are you going to approach this spot? What are you going to do about that? And he does a lot of this stuff. And it's not only building an edge, it's just uh, having more fun in the game. Which, and which also it gets I people out really of their comfort inspired. zone, right? If you get people out of their comfort yeah. zone, out of the lines that they're used to, they're more likely to screw up and make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. So, and he just went 75. And, and he does a lot of this stuff and I respect a lot. And I'm trying to do kind of the same. Uh, but it's actually pretty hard because you have to study a lot not to uh, fuck up too much. But at least but, 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 it's more interesting. That is the thing, right? Like, I've, I've, I've been struggling... In ways to explain this, nowadays I feel like I have a good a good way. Simplification has a place. It has a place. What you what you mentioned in like your baseline strategy. In your baseline strategy, what you're trying to do is you're trying to not fuck up. Okay, you're trying to make the play yeah. that can't be bad. But from there, if that's all you do, you stop to think, and poker becomes very boring, and you don't get the maximum out of your poker win rate. It's so that from there you can start to explore all the other options and try to maximize your win rate, try to capitalize on different plays. Okay, so both are necessary to some degree. If, if I would say, if you have no idea of what your baseline strategy is, then by all means, go in the solver, go build a good solid baseline strategy that's designed not to lose. Try to simplify that as, as much as possible. And then from there, you can add layers. From there, you can take more yeah. information, be creative on top of the, on top of the tables. Um, uh, actually, this reminded me the the thing that you said with Stefan throw out a seventy five reminded me of something that Owen Masur said in one of her previous episodes. He mentioned when a thing yeah, 
when a thing that's not a thing becomes a thing. So basically, you mm-hmm. do a thing that's not a thing, but depending on how your opponent responds, it can become a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, I, I, I really, I really, I really love that one. That one really stick, stick, stick by me. I really, really, really like that one. Also, uh, just like I said, I love the game and poker is so beautiful because when your opponent is uh, going in some direction, all of the strategy actually shifts a lot. And uh, sometimes you can say like, uh, I always, <laughs> it's kind of funny that I always see these uh, like people who just screenshot G2 uh, Wizard and uh, saying like, oh, my, he did such a big mistake. How is he supposed to play 5K and now he's just such a fish. There is no such a size right here, but uh, there might be a lot behind that and maybe he prepared and he doing just such a great thing right here which you are just don't understand completely because um yeah if you try to lock strategies and solver you can see all of this really crazy uh shifts in strategies and uh, yeah and people would never play like a gto bots i think because they just people yeah sure they can just go rca uh but if you are playing against people and he's for sure honest and uh, he plays himself he would never play like a gto bot i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure and uh if you understand his nature uh, how and why is he uh deciding to to do something you can actually uh, differ a lot from GTO strategy. Yeah, and I'm not saying that I'm a huge crusher and I'm like exploiting everyone, but that's a really beautiful part of this game, which I love and uh, which drives me a lot uh, to keep studying because it's so interesting that and it's so competitive that um, you can uh, always do this like a uh, race, you know, between mm-hmm. you and your opponents and your and population and uh, all of that so yeah i mean like um some strategy which now looks like yeah this is the right strategy in two years in if people uh you know change a lot can be not the best strategy and uh, other like uh, for example probably against people it's really good uh to uh like um I remember uh, that um, I uh, love Avril Lavigne. I, I don't remember his name, Matt, uh-huh. I think. Mm-hmm. He, you had him on the pod, and it was a really great pod, respect. Um, and we actually battle a lot on with uh, WPN. He is a great player. And remember, he said that uh, he uh, just uh, went crazy for betting every hand from Big Blind. and. This is just such a good thing that uh, in poker it's possible to go like that and still crush a lot. And actually, it might be a really good strategy in the pools where which don't have any like uh, uh, hot possible. It might be really good. Yeah, I mean, like even let's say yeah, he played pools. three bet only. Uh, he he played three bet only from the for all positions, right? At some point, he he experimented. I, I he would never call. Only, he was only three bet all positions. Yeah. Also from even, Big Blind. Even Big Blind. Yeah. Even, even <laughs> Big Blind. yeah. And uh, Big Blind is the most important here. I mean, like, the uh, funniest thing for me here is I think that it's possible if you just uh, put all of the high stakes players in the pool, they don't get any hot. It's probably uh, the best strategy to just rebet too much. I mean, it's yes. probably can be even in high stakes. Uh, population it can be mm-hmm. the best strategy this is a really cool thing <laughs> yeah and uh, it's I, crazy. I, I think i think kind of kind of some, summing this up is like we have to appreciate how and understand how fragile the equilibrium is right you mentioned a player yeah. can do this can do that for example i can throw out a donkey but uh, someone says hey you shouldn't dunk here of and like well okay if i dunk a board that should not be dunked and if i'm over dunking it he should be folding zero yeah. raising me 50 but he's actually folding yeah. so who's yeah. the idiot now you know yeah <laughs> yeah I, yeah yeah I'm dunking for... this thing about dunk is just so crazy because every dunk which is not supposed to be you should supposed to raise like huge huge margin and yeah you you should raise a lot fold, fold little and i throw out a dunk on a yeah. board that i shouldn't dunk and the guy folds i'm like yeah, then who makes the mistake here? 
Yeah, yeah, and and he would uh, take a screenshot and say like, yeah, uh, Waco is a very bad shape. He he haven't studied poker. He didn't understand that this board should not be dunked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or also like, and also like, like people don't know your exact range. It can also be that, let's say for example, my dunk in a certain spot. I would say this probably what happens more on Turn River. That let's say my dunk is too strong or too weak. Which part of the range mm-hmm. should you attack? Should you attack my dunk that's too strong, or should you attack my check? that's too too weak yeah. and then like for example if i don't dunk do they realize i have a dunking range so my checking range is not yeah, fully yeah. intact and do they then understand the consequences of that because you talked about sizing well let's say i let's say i dunk out a lot of my strong hands and i check a lot of my weak hands then let's say the range is intact the solver might be limited to betting three quarters but if i don't call my strong hands and check all my weekends suddenly it can now bet 300 pot so you see yeah, someone yeah. see, see stefan betting 300 pot while the solver says, hey, you can only bet three quarters, well, probably he understands the equities or how the ranges are lining up in this situation way better than the person screenshotting GTO Wizard and trying to make fun of Stefan. Right? <laughs> I would say I would yeah, bet that yeah. Stefan has a better idea of the ranges that are actually in place and the equities that are, are running in this hand than, than the person uh, uh, observing it. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Quick reminder, Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program is currently open for enrollment and we've put together the biggest promotion ever. 25% off on the program and three bonuses worth close to 3,000 euros of free value. Enrollment is open for the first couple of weeks of January before we close the program permanently. So don't miss out. Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com. Sign up now and let me and Adam help you achieve your poker goals in 2024. Adam, were you always in the simplified camp or are you uh, were you more trying to maneuver in the rounds of possibilities that poker strategy offers? Yeah, I think always start with that simplified strategy that you can execute at a high level. So you've got that baseline to fall back on. I think it's always really important. And then from there, you can be more creative. And yeah, I think I always had troubles when my baseline strategy wasn't strong enough and I was trying to be too creative on the edges, but I kind of be losing a bit of my kind of baseline strategy. So Been there, yeah, done that, always- uh, Adam. <laughs> yeah, get get too excited by novelty sometimes and want to learn new things. So, but yeah, I, do, I do think it's really important to... Uh, as you guys were speaking there as well, I was thinking about like the poker player trying to get better at the game. And one element is, yes, you want a good win rate, but as you guys were speaking, like to be curious, to continually want to evolve your strategy, keep getting better at the game, there needs to be an element of complication, problem solving, to keep the mind engaged and, and wanting to do more. So yeah, I think there's uh, both camps. I'm not on either camp, to be honest, in terms of where I said, I think it's a very important conversation to have around build that simplified strategy to begin with, but then putting layers on top of it and going into the realms of the complex strategies to uh, to build more, more, of a, more of a strategy as well. So yeah, I just want to bring a few more questions. I know we've had a long conversation so far, but I kind of want to talk about like kind of going from the cube to the poker table. So uh, we talked about some lessons you learned in terms of thinking ahead from your kind of speed cubing days. What are some of the lessons you've learned from your poker career that were unexpected going in? Mm-hmm. And that's a hard question. I think that Actually, I'm really grateful uh, for poker in my life because it taught me a lot. Like, uh, I'm, I think you can, poker is like, uh, this is uh, too much of a beautiful phrase, but poker is like a miracle to life because lots of thing, lots of um, things you deal with and you struggle with are like uh, the same in poker and life. And you have to do uh, some steps to get better in poker and same in, in life. And yeah, um, so I, I just, like I said, just really like the game, even uh, though sometimes uh, I can uh, like cry about my run and uh, like all this poker, all poker player do, I think. Uh, I just love this game because it's so beautiful and it's so complicated and it it has a lot of stuff uh behind it uh which you uh have to do in order to succeed in poker and this is the main thing which which i love and as for points uh as for compare uh compares um on uh, rubik's cube and uh uh, poker, I would say that uh, main thing is just practicing. I remember uh, 
in uh, Speed Cuban, there was like uh, this Australian guy, his name is uh, Felix Zendex, and he was like a huge crusher in that uh, speed, uh, in uh, Speed Cuban uh, back then. And uh, he did lots of interviews and uh, he was like a star in Speed Cuban. Uh, he was a kid and uh, he was like 15 years old or something like that. And he would always say the same phrase and it's just stuck in my mind. Uh, uh, they would always ask like, uh, how uh, did you get your success? Uh, and all of these questions. And he would always answer, just practice very much just practice very much and it's stuck in my head and yeah it's uh it works in whole uh like in the whole life i mean if you want to do something good just practice very much and just leave it and i remember even it's not only poker it's uh on my fourth uh year in the university i lived in the dorm with a friend of mine whose name is uh, ivan and uh, he just uh at some point, he thought that he would like to play guitar. And uh, he, he uh, just fell in love with playing guitar. And he started playing a lot, really a lot. And uh, he was just playing every day, like 10 to 12 hours. And in one year, he achieved so much success in guitar. Like, uh, because he was uh, my neighbor and we lived uh, together, uh, I get annoyed a lot. Uh, and I was like, uh, just uh, go fucking away from here with your fucking guitar. I was just so annoyed. But uh, I actually saw that uh, that person came from zero. He never played guitar before to play in such a good level. He, he could uh, play like every possible song, which I uh, liked. Uh, and I liked pretty, pretty... Uh, um, I, I, I don't know for sure because I don't play guitar, but I think these are pretty hard songs like Metallica and uh, uh, yeah, I, I so I love Metallica and I think probably the songs are pretty uh, hard, not sure. And I can uh, just uh, pick every song and he would play it like perfectly and uh, within one year. And uh, uh he played a lot for me uh, i just liked the song and say like play it and he would play like really really good and uh hearing this uh, i was uh, really amazed and i really liked in the end of uh this year I, I really liked when he played and i even begged him to do that in front of me because he played like really really good and this was within one year but he practiced crazy, crazy a lot amount and everybody would just uh, laugh at him like uh, uh, always with his guitar, buying lots of guitar, 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 guitar. His life is just guitar. But uh, yeah, it's actually another uh, sample uh, of my life, which uh, I see that practicing is uh, consistency is the key. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it's important as well, like the the way you practice and the way you get better to like go back to the Matt Marinelli episode of the podcast we had, he talked a lot about deliberate practice and deep work and not just like showing up to practice and learn skills, but to really be fully immersed in what you're doing. As you mentioned your friend there, he's just living that guitar. Like he's fully yeah. going for it. Whereas some of like a person will be watching a YouTube video, doing a little bit of do some songs, but like not really fully engaged in it. And it's a very different type of practice. So even for yourself when you're studying or learning poker, you've mentioned a few times in this, in this episode, like, um, living it, living poker. And that's very different to somebody who's like kind of just dabbling or just trying to get better. So yeah, I think getting better at skills and understanding any skill is trainable and you can develop skills, but you've got to put uh, a lot of attention and effort into it, deliberate practice for a long period of time and do that consistently. And once you do that for a long period of time, you realize that, wow, everything's just a skill that can be developed and yeah. which skills I want to get good at and apply my time to, whether it's a Rubik's cube, whether it's climbing the poker ladder. And you mentioned as well, like how uh, uh, poker's like got like lots of Lots of things that you're developing as a person and i feel like poker is like the ultimate hero's journey so the hero's journey is all about you're the hero and you take on like a quest to uh, to achieve a goal and then you as you're on your path you hit obstacles things don't go your way you come create kind of challenges and you need to level up your character in order to keep going on the path and you just keep getting more and more challenges and every challenge you go through levels up your character so you're finally ready to the for the end result to uh, transform or reach your destination and that's normally when you have to fight like your biggest 
demons or your biggest kind of challenges. And that's often when you, for poker, the poker analogy is reaching high stakes or the, the vision that you had for your career. And that's when you have to really work on yourself the most to become the version of yourself at the end of it. And often you think that journey is just this external thing, especially when you start out, you like make loads of money, have the freedom, the lifestyle, all external. But really on that journey, you realize it's all an internal journey. It's all about you becoming a better version of yourself. And everything around it, the, all the external stuff was just the, like the outward stuff, but the internal journey was way more important. And at the end of it, when you sit on the, the end of your career, you look back and go, wow, I became a better version of myself from playing a card game. That's amazing. That's so, so cool. So yeah. I think for yourself, like talking, as you've uh, relayed a lot of stuff, I was like just picturing this kind of hero's journey. You're going through it, leveling up your character, enjoying the journey as well. I think one thing I've got from you from this conversation is the importance of loving what you do, the importance of loving the pursuit, the journey itself, and not trying to force that. I think for you, even the Rubik's Cube, there's something about your mind that gravitates towards things and like just holds onto it. I think you mentioned, I think you said it took a year to go from, for a lot of people, it takes a year to go from 20 seconds of a Rubik's Cube to 10 seconds. Now, that must be a long year of fine tuning stuff that most people go, you yeah. know what? I think, I think I'm done. Like I got a 20 seconds. I'm a pretty good Rubik's Cuber. I think I'll call that one a good chapter, but you just kept going and kept going and kept going. So I think there's something about your mind that seeks that, wants to be the best at what you do. I think you mentioned a few times that competition. So I, yeah, really, really good. I think I've, I've learned a lot myself in this conversation and I'm hoping the audience go away and re-listen to uh, a lot of the points. Anything for yourself that you'd like our audience to uh, take note of from this conversation or to uh, go away from that they could take action on? Yeah, uh, I think... Uh... I think I, I uh, said enough, uh, and uh, I think when um, you ask me this question and nothing pops up immediately, probably I shouldn't say much more. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think you've shared a lot of wisdom and a lot of ways of dealing with challenges. I think lots of little lessons have, have come throughout this conversation. And yeah, I think it's been very valuable. We touched on a lot of topics. Uh, myself and Renny will probably summarize at the end uh, going forward. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate the amount of yeah, energy you put into this conversation. And yeah, I look forward to listening back. And thank you very much. Yeah, I, I want to thank you uh, very much, not only for this pod, but uh, also for doing uh, all of the pods, because I uh, like I love the game and I love when people try to um, show it from like a more uh, athlete way uh, let's say um, Rene mentioned uh, much times in this sport uh, this word athlete and uh, I don't think poker is a sport but I think athlete is a very very good explanation of what you should become in order to succeed in poker uh, yeah, and so thank you a lot for sharing this uh, and for showing uh, it's more like uh, in a way of uh, maybe. So yeah, sharing in this way because all of the pods you you really uh, dive deep into. I, I actually watched uh, lots of your pods, really lots. Um, I can say that uh, I'm really close to being fan of your podcast <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot for doing that uh, and uh, yeah thank you for this one thanks for having me um, I had a great conversation and I practiced my English which is also uh, very good so thanks a lot great conversation that was with Nikolai Adam any main takeaways yeah I've got a, quite a lot he's got a fascinating mind and yeah, I think we started the conversation very in depth with how he thinks about the Rubik's Cube. And then we went into uh, his poor career. And one of the things I wanted to uh, note was the terminology he used around this downswing period. And uh, he mentioned not losing your win rates and the importance of when you're on a downswing, doing the right things so that your win rate doesn't go from five BBs to two BBs to, to negative. And I think it was really important how we talked about rest and recovery, but the, the, the mindset of thinking, okay, if I don't take precautions, if I don't uh, take more recovery, study more, do the right things to prepare myself, my win rate is going to go down. And it's almost like a bit naive to think on a downswing, you just play through it and you come to the side, everything's great. So I think his experience of having a six month long downswing really reminded him that, look, like my win rate isn't guaranteed. I need to do things so that my win rates to protect my win rate, so to speak. So yeah, I think it was a really important lesson of how not to lose your win rate. You use rest as a, as a tool and basically how to take breaks to uh, get your mental fatigue down, but also your curiosity back. Uh, but yeah, I think overall, just thinking about how to uh, 
perform at a high level, which takes me to the next point where he talks about treating poker like an athlete, and I think this is what your, your terminology as well, of how to uh, prepare properly for poker and treat everything holistically around performance, optimizing your schedule, your days, so you can perform at a high level for what you do. And it's so important if you want to play high-stakes poker to realize you're competing against other guys who are pretty smart and they're pretty dedicated. So you've got to do the, everything you needed to perform at a high level and how much your win rate is dependent on the things you do off the table. I think that's a really big factor as well. That as we, if I listen back to this podcast, I'm sure I will take more and more notes on, yeah, the kind of advantages you gain from approaching yeah, poker more holistically and maximizing all uh, lifestyle factors. Then another one I remember to write down was coming to terms with the worst case scenario. And he uses, the, I like these little reflections he was using on his phone where he was doing these little audios. Very nice. I, I thought about doing this myself, but never create a habit. So I'd be more of a journal writer, but it really made me think how important it is to uh, get your ideas out. But for him, he was using, using it as a preparation tool for his grinds. So he's quite a risk averse person or he likes to, uh, yeah, kind of scared of losing his bankroll, as he mentions. So for him, he needs to ch meet that challenge head on. So going into a poker session to remind himself that it could be a losing day, a losing session, and to be okay with that, to come to peace with that. So when he sits down to play, loses five buy-ins, loses 10 buy-ins, as he's going through that experience, like, ah, I was prepared for this. It's not a big of a deal. So uh, yeah, lots of tools around preparing himself right. And also he mentions perspective skills of remind himself that you could die at any point or death is an option. So uh, how bad is this downswing or this experience he's going through? I think all of these are like little tools that he's picked up throughout his experiences that have allowed him to uh, not only progress to the, the stage he's playing, but also enjoy the process. What I liked about the conversation was how much he, he loves poker, he enjoys the game, he enjoys the pursuit. And I think that has been allowed to happen due to uh, yeah a lot of the kind of work he's put on, into himself away from the tables, which I thought was really, really good. How about yourself, Ronnie? What are the main things you've noted down? Yeah, he got really fired up when we started to talk about all the little things you can do to gain some win rate here, right? And we really talked about like that bigger picture win rate. When people think win rate, they think, oh, I'm going to improve my win rate. Let's dive into the solver. But no, he was way more interested in like the management side of your career. How can I manage my win rate? I think that was really a big takeaway from uh, this conversation. He also at the end... Uh, he summed it up, I think, himself. He said, just practice very much. He said, yeah, you can just study poker. He said, studying too much, he thought, was actually a leak. You should go out there and play. And he said also that a very big part of your win rate is just being there and showing up. I think it was Patrick Howard that said the same thing. I've heard this before in one of the previous podcasts. A very big part of your win rate is just showing up and being there when, in this case, the VIP decides to... Uh, yeah, donate a lot of money. So he said just being around there, being in the lobbies and also taking that in consideration, right? I think we gave the example, if you play a 10-hour session waiting for the VIP to arrive in the lobbies, then maybe it's not a great idea to already waste all your energy in the first three hours of your session playing tables that are very bad, okay? So again, bigger picture. Uh, we also talked like strategy quite a lot. Uh, a main takeaway that I wrote down is that studying GTO and creating your default strategies and maybe simplifying here and there, especially in the more uh, unfrequent spots is definitely, you know, advisable, right? We're trying to play defensive, trying not to lose, have a good baseline, but from there kind of appreciating how fragile the equilibrium actually is and how many possibilities actually open up when we start to think, okay. When we start to ask ourselves the right questions, very in line with the, uh, with our philosophy, I think I got pretty fired up when we talked about that topic as well. Definitely something that we like to educate in the mechanics of poker as well. And last but not least, as you know, new year, big goals. Decide on having bigger goals and think about what you have to do in order to achieve them. He was kind of just grinding mid stakes because in his reality, it was like, yeah, high stakes is dead. You know, I'm just grinding a little bit of mid stakes. We also talked about like the safety feeling that this gives. Right, people think that staying at a certain stake is actually safe, but actually it's not because it's a constantly moving thing. There's no stagnation; you either go forward or backward. And often taking that shot and trying to reach higher stakes is actually less safe if you think about it than just staying there and being grinded away. And at some point, you know, you have to get back to a real job. But he at some point said, "Okay, I'm going to go for high stakes," and thought about, "Well, what do I have to then do?" So he built a baseline strategy. He studied like 10 to 20 hours on every spot, creating a good baseline strategy. Not only GTO. We also talked, you know, looking at like exploits that he could pull off based on stuff that he saw in population, uh, and then from there, just execute, execute toward that bigger goal, which for him was to reach high stakes. So I don't know what your bigger goals are in 2024. 
I'm sure you have them. And for that reason, we have reopened the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 coaching program. If you want to realize these poker goals, if you want to work with me and Adam, now is the chance because for one last time and for a limited amount of time, only we've reopened the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 program to make sure you guys take action. We created the best promotion we have ever created. There's a discount. There's over 3,000 euro worth of free value in bonuses. So go check that out. Mechanicsofpoker.com. Limited time only. Enrollment is open for anyone. Mechanicsofpoker.com. You can join there. Also, any takeaways that you have, leave them down in the description. GTO Wizard, our sponsor, will give one free GTO Wizards uh, subscription for one month. So I'm very curious what your main takeaways are. I'd like to thank again, Nikolai, for coming on the pod. I would like to thank Adam for co-hosting this podcast with me. I would like to thank you guys for tuning in, showing love, also continuing in 2024. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys in the next episode.